This is Jocko Podcast number 95 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress July 9th, 1918, takes pleasure in presenting the Distinguished Service Cross to Second Lieutenant Air Corps James K. Kunkel, United States Army Air Forces, for extraordinary heroism in connection with military operations against an armed enemy while serving as the pilot of a P-38 fighter airplane in the 401st Fighter Squadron, 370th Fighter Group, 9th Air Force, in aerial combat against enemy forces on 16 September 1944 during an air mission over Aiken, Germany. On this date, while flying as rear man in a squadron on an armed reconnaissance mission, Lieutenant Kunkel noticed that his squadron was about to be surprised by a vastly superior force of enemy aircraft. Unable to summon his leader on the radio, he alone unhesitatingly pulled away from his formation and vigorously attacked the enemy, immediately destroying one of his aircraft. In doing so, Lieutenant Kunkel placed himself in a position to be attacked from rear and above. When this attack materialized, many hits were registered on his aircraft, which caught fire, burning his face, neck, and hands. Despite his burning plane and the gunfire from enemy planes, Lieutenant Kunkel continued his attack against the vastly superior enemy force and succeeded in destroying a second enemy aircraft breaking off combat only when forced to parachute to safety when his left fuel tank exploded. Second Lieutenant Kunkel's unquestionable valor in aerial combat is in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflects great credit upon himself, the 9th Air Force, and the United States Army Air Forces. So, that is a military citation for a distinguished service cross. And this pilot also flew missions just after D-Day, including armed reconnaissance flights and attacks on German trains and vehicles and airfields. And also, this pilot flew close air support missions to help push Germany out of France and drive allied troops towards victory. And it is an absolute honor to have this pilot, this hero on the podcast with us today, Mr. Jim Kunkel. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. It is great to have you on. More than welcome. (laughs) And, you know, if that wasn't good enough, I am also honored to welcome back to the podcast Jim Kunkel's friend, fellow pilot, another American hero, Captain Charlie Plum, F-4 Phantom pilot, shot down on his 75th mission in Vietnam War and spent six years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Captain Charlie Plum, sir. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, Jocko. Nice to be back. And for those of you that haven't listened to Captain Plum the first time he came on on the podcast, just stop now. Go to podcast number 76 because that is a that is a whole incredible story of of his time in captivity. It's detailed in in the book that Captain Plum wrote which is called I'm No Hero. But go back and listen to that, and then you can return and you can listen to this podcast. But it was interesting because when we got done with that first podcast, and I was taking Captain Plum to the to the train station, which is which is odd in its own right to have the pilot riding a train. I don't, I don't know if you'd approve of that to <laughs> to have the captain on a train. But and he said, "Hey, you know, I got this buddy. You 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 might want to talk to him." And he said, "You know, he's a World War II pilot, fighter pilot, and." You know he's a be be a great guy to talk to, and of course I said, uh, yeah, absolutely. So it took us a little bit of time, but here we are, 
and this is also the first time we've had more than one guest at one time on the podcast. And sitting amongst you two, my plan is to sit back and listen to you two talk about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> I've heard some of the stories, and uh, and actually, interestingly, the podcast that just came out last week was about a book called The Men at Arnhem, which detailed the the British participation in the in Operation Market Garden, which started on September 17th, 1944. And as I was reading your citation, if you noticed, that was September 16th, 1944, <laughs> that, you were, that you were shot down. And that's, that's uh, right at the beginning or right, right before that, that operation took place. That's very true. And uh, of course I missed it. Uh, but I heard uh, some very interesting stories later on. Uh, uh, I was picked up in a, uh, uh, a VAC hospital uh, by the first, well, the first infantry division picked me up. They saw my chute and came out and got me. And uh, uh, thank goodness it was uh, never leave anyone behind. So they didn't leave me behind, and I thanked them profusely. But uh, uh, through the VAC hospital to uh, a, uh, a general hospital, and then a hospital train to Paris, and the train was completely full of uh, casualties from the Arnheim operation. So uh, I wasn't too good a shape at that time to listen to the stories, but later on in the hospital in Paris, I heard some real horror stories about what went on up there. And <clears throat> being a Ninth Air Force pilot, uh, uh, we were working with the ground troops, and we really appreciated what their their problems were and, and the difficulties that they had, and we tried to help them in every way that we could. So um, it, it was a uh, it was a very trying time. So I guess before we get into all that at any greater depth, how did you end up? As a pilot, what you know? How did how did you end up there? In terms of where did you grow up? And I know you grew up here in in California. No, I was born in Pennsylvania, yeah, New Kensington, Pennsylvania. My father was uh, was in the steel business, and um, in 1932, uh, my dad uh, passed away from injuries that he had received in the First World War. Mm -hmm. And so we, at that time, he had retired from his business, uh, even though he was only 36 years old at that time. But uh, we were coming to California. And uh, in fact, we were pretty well packed and had closed the house and the whole works. I'm nine years old. And uh, he went to the hospital in New York instead and passed away. And my mother, uh, who uh, didn't even drive an automobile at that time. Uh, I can remember uh, her asking me, do you want to go to California? And I said, yes. And she took some driving lessons and bought a Chevy. And we came to California on Route 66 when they were building it. <laughs> and so my mother prayed her way to California. I bet if her, she's a new driver, I bet she wasn't the only one that was praying. No, I'm yeah. sure of it. <laughs> but uh, even at nine, I can still remember uh, she was driving in, in the mud of Texas, and I'm out pushing. <laughs> so my mother uh, was a very courageous woman. <laughs> no doubt. So he, um, my dad had been very interested in aviation, and I picked that up. In fact, uh, uh, he used to do uh, uh, steel castings for uh, Curtis Wright in, um, uh, in Buffalo, New York, and we'd go up there, and every, every time we went on a trip, and I'm six, seven, eight, eight years old, we'd go flying. Wow. We'd go for a ride someplace. And so I, I picked it up at that time and, and pursued it. And then you, you get out to California, and that's where you go through high school and whatnot? I went through high school. I uh, uh, ended up in Beverly Hills High School. And uh, September, um, 
1939, as you know, the war started. Well, pr just prior to that, I mean, it was all the talk of Europe and the possibility of war. And I decided that this is going to be my senior year. And if there's going to be a war, we're going to be in it one way or another. And so uh, I went out and joined the California Air National Guard. Uh, they, um, they had a squadron that was based in Griffith Park, California. And it was um, a bunch of uh, World War I pilots. And we had some old biplanes, Douglas O-38 uh, observation aircraft, uh, open cockpit. And some of the later ones had even had a canopy over them. And I, um, I really uh, had been hanging around airports. My mother was very um, helpful. She, this was before I had a driver's license. She would take me out to the local airports, Grand Central Air Terminal. And I'd spend the whole day Saturday out there. And sometimes you'd even get a 10-minute ride if anybody had any money to buy gas with. But... Um, Coming back to the Guard, uh, I spent a year with them, and it was a very, very interesting year. The, these fellows that uh, were the pilots, they were all mostly uh, combat pilots from World War I. And um, I sat at their knee and, and listened to all the stories. From that, um, uh, the, uh, I, of course, my idea was I was going to be a fighter pilot, uh, I had friends at Lockheed, and I knew about the P-38, and I decided that uh, I wanted to fly a P-38s, and I wanted to go to England. And um, luckily, it worked out that way. So what, what year did you transfer from the, the Air National Guard into, and how did you get a commission? Did you get a commission? Did you have to go to college, or did you not have to go to college at that time to get a commission and be a pilot? Uh, Actually, uh, the Guard was federalized, and uh, we, we went on maneuvers uh, to Chehalis, Washington, and we were attacking Fort, um, Fort Lewis. And um, <clears throat> the Guard, uh, we were the attackers, and the, we were up there for three weeks on maneuvers. Well, while we were up there, we got notice that uh, the, Air, the Air Guard was going to be federalized and drawn into active duty. And it, I wasn't 18 years old yet, so I had to have permission. Were you already a pilot at this time? Oh, no. Oh, okay, I'm, so I'm you a, were. I'm a gunner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a rear gunner in, a, <laughs> in an it. airplane that would, <laughs> that would maybe go 150 <laughs> miles an hour. So, uh, but, um, no, I was in the armament section, and it was uh, run by a, a Sergeant White, and Sergeant White kind of took me under his wing, and I, I got some pretty nice uh, assignments out of it. And I learned a lot. Um, I got to fly in the back seat, and uh, I'd go out on weekends. Uh, you know, we had duty once a month uh, in the Guard, but you could go out on weekends, and I'd work at the airport and uh, get an extra flight in, and the the pilots of the guard were if they knew you were interested they would take you under their wing so i got quite a bit of flying time and nice. um for a 17 year old yeah. <laughs> if you're 17 years so old i was just 17 in fact i was uh 16 when i joined <laughs> and um so was, but you know this cut into my school uh not the um, academics because i wanted to be a uh, Air Force pilot, you had to be 21, you had to have two years of college, and um, in 1940 and 41, this is uh, getting pretty tight to, to uh, when we entered the war. So I didn't really figure I was going to graduate from college, so I wanted to get in the, the classes that would do me the most good if I could become a, an aviation cadet. And... Um, it it all it all worked out. Uh, we um, in the interesting thing was to me uh, uh, in April I took some time off on school and I went down and got a, a job at North American Aviation and I worked on the first ten P fifty ones built 
Uh, I can see them on today on the line. In fact, one of the, of the original first 10 is in the museum at Oshkosh. Hmm. So someplace within that airframe, there's some of my work. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, that was, uh, uh, that would have been the summer of 1941. Uh, <clears throat> September and I was going back to school and I had become accustomed to all that money I'd been making at North American. We, we got 35 cents an hour when I started there. <laughs> nice. But, you know, 35 cents an hour wasn't too bad because uh, I worked alongside people that had two or three kids and they're supporting the whole family on that 35 cents an hour. Uh, we had a little uh, labor dispute at North American and they raised it to 50 cents. So we were really rolling in, <laughs> in cash. But um, in September, um, I wanted to get back to school, but I enjoyed that income. So I went to Lockheed. They had a graveyard shift. And um, I worked at 7th and Santa Fe, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, Lockheed Aircraft had taken over this big warehouse. And they were building the wings and the empennage for the P-38. And they were also building the wings for the Hudson bomber, which they'd gotten this very large contract from, from the British. And um, it, uh, it, I was there when the war started, actually. I, could, I was there the night that they attacked Los Angeles and the whole place was blacked out. If you remember the famous story of the air raid on Los Angeles. That, uh, I don't remember that story well, very clearly. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't even close to being born <laughs> no, yet. No. Neither was my dad. <laughs> so what happened when they attacked Los Angeles? Well, How did I miss out on those? The, the, probably the most logical story that I ever heard was that a, a Navy uh, PBY flew over Los Angeles and somebody hit the panic button and all the... The searchlights came on, and uh, you could hear uh, an aircraft in the background, probably from Fort MacArthur or someplace like that, and the whole Lockheed plant was blacked out. So we sat there in the dark for about three hours while they fought this battle with, uh, with the unseen enemy. And it, of course, made all of the newspapers. It was, uh, <laughs> it was a big story. So... Uh, uh, anyway, uh, World War II started, as far as the U.S. was concerned, uh, December 7th. Uh, right after that, they, uh, uh, they dropped the age limit from uh, 21 to 18 for the aviation cadet program. They dropped the, the two-year con uh, uh, college uh, requirement to a high school. And so... Uh, I went down and signed up with about 300,000 other guys. <laughs> and, and, All um, for, are they, there was that many people that wanted to be pilots? Oh, they, they were thick. <laughs> wow. In fact, uh, uh, I was quite concerned. Um, I, um, I signed up. They, uh, that would have been in June. I waited until September before they called me down to downtown Los Angeles and swore me in as a private, as a duration, as a cadet, and uh, thought, well, now I'm on my way. Well, then I went home and waited another four or five months before mm. they called us up. They, were, they had so many people, that, and there was no place to put them. They were trying to build Santa Ana Army Air Base, which was the induction uh, area for, uh, for cadets on the West Coast. And um, they were just overwhelmed with, uh, they didn't even have the barracks to, to put them in. So eventually I got called up and I went through in um, a little less than 10 months through uh, uh, Santa Ana, which is a free flight. Uh, went up to Tulare, California uh, as for primary in Stearman's uh, to Tex Rankin School. And Tex had been a, the aerobatic champion 
uh, of the U.S. and so uh, it was it was a fun school. So they so they they hired the best civilian pilot and had him come out and train you guys. That's correct. In fact, uh, Tex actually owned that operation. They um, they appointed most of the primary was uh, uh, were a private uh, enterprise that were set up by the Air Force for cadet training in primary uh, in the primary bases. And so uh, you, you went through, about, got about 60 hours, and I flew the Stearman, and we have behind us our competitor, but <laughs> this aircraft was used mainly on the East Coast. We didn't see many of them out in California. We had Stearmans and Ryans and, on the West Coast. Um, got through primary, uh, went to basic, now we're on a military base, and the, I went to Lemoore, California. And that was one of the largest um, uh, Air Force bases, or Army Air Corps bases. Uh, and it's just, uh, it, on final, you can still see the hangars and everything. The final at Lemoore Naval Air Station, you can still see all the hangars uh, from, um, from our old base. Wow. But um, got through basic. Went down to Williams Field, Arizona, and uh, that brought me closer to the P-38. Uh, most of the P-38s came out of Williams Field, uh, just south of uh, Phoenix. And from there, uh, we were on a fast track, and we weren't quite sure why we were on this big fast track, but all of a sudden, we get 90 days. Uh, I got to fire the guns once in the P-38, uh, one gun. We had four fifties and a twenty millimeter in the nose, and they let us fire one of the fifties. Uh, all of a sudden, we're on a, a train going to the East Coast, and we're heading for England. Wow! When you when you said you wanted to fly a P thirty eight, and yet you had worked on the P fifty ones, what was the deciding factor that made you want to fly a P thirty eight instead of a P fifty one? Uh, the P-38 was a high-altitude fighter. It was, uh, it was, prob- it was our first uh, real combat aircraft. The P-40 was a stopgap airplane, did very well. P-39 didn't do well at all. Um, the 38 was the only high-performance airplane we had. The P-51 at the time that I worked on it was a low-altitude airplane. It had an Allison engine and anything above... 11 to 12,000 feet, you're, you're out of power. So um, uh, the 51 was going to be a, um, uh, a low-altitude British-used aircraft, and that's what they wanted, extremely fast, and they used it for uh, uh, tactical work. And um, so that, as far as I wanted to be in air, aerial combat, <laughs> I wanted to be a fighter pilot and shoot down a bunch of airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I stuck with the 38, and of course I didn't realize the British were putting a Merlin engine in the P-51 about that time, and we were going to get the greatest air-to-air combat airplane of the war. <laughs> but um, Yeah, the, I guess that's what threw me off was because, you know, I always thought of the P-51 as being, as being, you know, the best air-to-air combat uh, aircraft of the war, but I didn't realize that it had go, didn't get there immediately, and it had to get there in stages. So that 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 makes sense to me now. Yeah, well, they did come in stages, and plus the fact that when they did get the Merlin engine, it went to the Eighth Air Force, and the Eighth Air Force had the greatest POR group in the whole world. Uh, they <laughs> they they. Um, uh, they had access to all the newspapers. Huh. They got all the publicity. The P-51 was the greatest airplane in the whole world. And the poor old P-38 had been soldiering from early 1942 in the Pacific on yeah. to North Africa and, uh, and doing well all the way. And no matter what you ask it to do, it could do it. So um, I was still a P-38 uh, uh, fan. I uh, got to England, and I had um, great interest in aerial combat. Uh, there was a fellow by the name of Screwball Burling, who was an RAF pilot, 
And he was one of the greatest deflection uh, shooting experts in the in combat, I guess. And he was the hero of Malta in the RAF. So, so you said the greatest what deflection? Deflection shooting. Yeah. Which is what is that? That means that uh, when you're camera, when you're coming in on an aircraft, if you're on his tail, you've got zero deflection. If he's in a turn, now you've got to move the note, your your aim point out in front of that airplane. Got it. And you've got what they called a hundred mil sight, uh, uh, which was a I've forgotten now, I guess, but it was about so many inches per thousand feet. Mm. And and radii, you'd say if you're if you're in a say a thirty degree turn, you might put one radii or radii and half in front of him and it's all eyeball mm -hmm. uh 90 degrees you're out maybe seven radii way out here mm. and so uh, uh that's deflection shooting now this is before we got the gyro sight which we never got in the p-38 but the 51's got the uh, gyro sight that computed that for you mm. so you'd put the the size of the airplane would be put into the site by a little slide uh, uh, thing. And that adjusted your site uh, on your reflector. And so then you'd put the pipper right on the aircraft and the site would compute Got it. The, uh, the leads necessary to hit it. So uh, anyway, I had studied those angles off in, you know, an hour before you go to sleep, after you go to bed, you're, you're doing computations on how many uh, uh, radii lead from what position, whether you're going up or going down or sideways or whichever way you want to go. But um, all set for real combat. I get to England, and um, all of a sudden I'm in the Ninth Air Force. Now, this is the, the MUD Air Force and the support of uh, the ground troops and, and uh, all operations, usually at fairly low altitude. So, so you're calling them the MUD Air Force? Is that what, you're, is that what you said? Yep. And that's just a, that's delineating that these guys are working with the ground troops and We're, you're flying low, and the dream of aerial combat is not so much there right now? That's right. No, the, Air, <laughs> the 8th Air Force, is, the Glamour Air Force has got the... All the, uh, you guys must have been uh, all ears, though. I mean, you talked about screwball, but but the RAF pilots that had fought the Battle of Britain. I mean, did, were you guys getting lessons learned from them, and and were you were they actually directly teaching you guys at all? Uh, they talked to us. Uh, we didn't have any formal instruction from them, but uh, conversations, and usually at the bar, at the O Club or the Officers Club, as mm -hmm. we called it. Uh, I got two two good points. Uh, an old RAF sergeant who had flown in the Battle of Britain told me that um, if you have a jerry on your tail, do something violent. He said, doesn't mm -hmm. make any difference what it is, just make sure it's violent. And the second thing was keep your eye on his exhaust because that's the first indication you're going to get of what, what he's trying to do. And um, I thought those were two good points, and I used them couple times yeah the, the the violent piece i mean you could apply that to really many situations in life where you know we see people and they're they're in a bad position in life they need to do something violent to move out of that situation That's not absolutely just sit right. there and wait for something <laughs> to unfold that was not only air combat that <laughs> went through a lot <laughs> yeah. yeah and that's interesting about watching the exhaust because you'd see a change of like a plume come out of yeah, the exhaust or you'd see the right. exhaust cut off and you'd know what type of maneuver they were going to do yep. whether you're He's trying to pull a fast one and yank the power off, and you overrun him, and he shoots you down. <laughs> so, but the Mud Air Force uh, that came along, um, uh, we began to realize just how much help we were to the the ground forces, and and it was pretty primitive. But I, I'm covering a lot of area here in a big, in a relatively short time, but. Uh, you know, we we had we had no navigational radio. Uh, we had four-channel VHFs. Uh, that meant that 
usually we could talk amongst the squadron, but the word was don't be an earache squadron, don't talk on the RT, <laughs> yep. stay off it. <laughs> I, I, we had that same philosophy in all my SEAL platoons and SEAL task units, stay off the radio. Yep. And uh, now you're trying, you know, we're doing ground support. Uh, they'd give us uh, coordinates uh, on the chart. Now you could go, go out and find it, with the, and it's all eyeball. So when you're eyeballing the ground and you're looking for ground targets, you're wide open in your six, six mm. o'clock position. So, uh, so would you, would you fly with multiple people or multiple aircraft so someone had the duty of watching the rear? Uh, yes, uh, we did. In fact, that's, uh, I got the duty several times. Uh, what we, we did, uh, we usually flew as a squadron. Sometimes we'd fly as a group with three squadrons. Uh, usually we'd try to put up at least 12 aircraft as a squadron. A uh, max uh, would be maybe four flights of four, 16. And so uh, to, uh, to answer your question about, um, uh, you know, being attacked from the rear and so forth in the six o'clock, the Germans uh, developed a tactic against the, the tactical aircraft, as, which we were, and they, would, they started vectoring uh, their fighters in uh, with ground control radar, and your first indication was all of a sudden you had a swarm of uh, enemy aircraft at your six o'clock. <laughs> And in early August of 44, uh, one of our sister uh, groups, P-38 Group, 9th Air Force, uh, lost a half a squadron. It just they got hit, and they, they were surprised. And um, so we thought, well, boy, we better, start, we better do something about that. So we started putting uh, a couple experienced people. Instead of putting your, your first... Uh, a uh, mission fellow in the rear end, Purple Heart Corner, we called it, uh, <laughs> let him drag along. Where we thought, well, let's put somebody back there that's going to have a little experience anyway. And, and so we, we did that. And I drew one of the first uh, missions back there. And, and sure enough, here they came. And uh, I spotted them and called the break and made the break. The squadron kept on going. And the break is, you're saying, hey, I'm going to break off from the squadron right now, or someone needs to come with me, or we need to face this other issue over here. We got a bunch of enemy aircraft coming. That's what that's what calling the break yeah, is? Call your break. You know, when you call the break, the, whoever spotted the aircraft leads the break because you don't want to lose them. You, know, you can't take, if you, you see them, you got to keep your eyeball on them or you're going to lose them. And... Uh, so you make you call the break. You make your break into them from whatever position they're coming from. The squadron then will break with you, and so all aircraft are now turning into the enemy. And probably um, an experienced air-to-air -air combat group. That was just a normal procedure. Our Ninth Air Force guys, we didn't do much of this, and so. Um, uh, when I called, I called the break. I made the break, and all of a sudden, I'm by myself. <laughs> the squadron kept on going, and now whether they didn't hear me or whatever, I I have no idea. So all I had was a couple of FW 190s and uh, a round circle sitting on a flat wing, Eesh. and all lit up with 20 millimeters, and we're doing. We got into a pretty tight turn, and and. Um, <clears throat> All of a sudden, I lost them in the turn, and uh, I'm looking at my six o'clock, and you might as well have been facing backwards. It would have been a lot easier, but uh, I turned around front, and in my gun sight, here's an FW-190. I mean, I'm on top of it. Hmm. And he um, apparently spotted me about the same time I, I I think I fired a burst at him. I'm not even sure. But he did a flick roll so quick that I literally, he just flick rolled out of my thing. P-38 
P38 wouldn't do that, the early ones. Uh, the later ones had aileron boost, and they would actually could perform that fast roll, radar roll. So he, um, he got away from me, and I was in a perfectly wonderful shot <laughs> position to shoot him down. Um, so that was the, our first encounter. And the second encounter was the one where you would read the citation. I made the break, nobody came with me, and I had more than I could handle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when, we, when you, before we get to that one, when you were doing close air support for troops on the ground, and you had four radio nets that you could be on, would you be talking to the guys on the ground? Uh, yes, and some, some, sometimes you could. You'd be under with the controller. Now, the, uh, the Ninth Air Force was mainly P-47s. We had one group of P-51s, 354th, and they had been the pioneer group with the Merlin-powered uh, 51, but they ended up in the Ninth Air Force, but usually they were used with the Eighth Air Force for the escort of the bombers. But um, so the, the majority, and the Ninth Air Force was a big air force. We had a lot of fighter groups. I've forgotten now how many we actually had, but most of them were P-47s. The 47 was a great uh, aircraft for close support. And um, uh, we had four groups of P-38s in, in the thing. So most of the close support work was done by the P-47s. In a real max effort, we were used as cl mm -hmm. close support. But uh, the P-47 was very short-ranged. Uh, 38, we had a lot of range. We could carry a, a larger bomb load than either the 47 or the 51. Actually, the 38 could carry two 2,000-pound bombs. Now that's 4,000 pounds, mm -hmm. and that's you're up in B-17 country if, with that. So uh, uh, we couldn't always get them. Usually we could find some 1,000 pounds, but normally we'd carry two 500s. Mm -hmm. um, I like the 1,000 because the bigger the bang is, the less chance you have to go back and do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and when you went back to do it again, they're waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> And so, so up until that point, that was kind of your primary mission and was going in and hitting railway stations or fa munitions factories. Armed reconnaissance, anything that moved. Hmm. And if you couldn't find anything you moved, you try to shoot the ins insulators off the high tension lines. <laughs> so any anything you could get. Um, we, uh, there was... There was no problem finding targets. And different from the 8th Air Force, uh, uh, we were over the target area uh, in a relatively short time, so uh, uh, they were shooting at you most of the time. How long did you, how long did you arrive in England before D-Day actually happened? Uh, just a short time before D-Day, and I've forgotten the exact date that we did arrive in England. And uh, Had you flown missions before D-Day Started no, no. no. so I your first not. missions were actually uh, right, were right, right the after D-Day, and the 38s, and uh, because they were so easy to recognize in the air, uh, we were assigned the channel. Uh, we we flew top cover for the channel, all the shipping and everything between England and the beachhead, and uh, it, we at that time it became very apparent that the reason we had been rushed into through training into England was they anticipated uh, heavy losses. Uh, we expected the Luftwaffe to really show during the invasion. They didn't. Mm -hmm. As I think you've read that there were just, a, I think they had two sorties over the beachhead on D-Day. And uh, we anticipated that there would be a, a large e effort against the, the channel with all the shipping. I mean, you could probably walk across the channel with the number of ships uh, that were there. Um, this tremendous target, Luftwaffe didn't show up. So uh, it, uh, most of the, the, like my group, the... Um, the DJ uh, missions were pretty boring. 
when you were when D Day was about to go. I mean, it's every single person. You guys must have absolutely known that what you were about to do was the, was you know going to be the one of the most epic undertakings of the modern history. Oh yes, uh, it was a hundred percent. You guys all knew that, and it well, was well. Every little by road in England was jammed with equipment, and you know it's funny uh, coming back to a. Uh, some of the things we hear today about our country. Uh, in, in 1940, 41, uh, I, well, 1940, I was up in Chehalis, Washington, and we were flying uh, those old O-38s. We had two brand-new airplanes from North American, O-47s, had a 1,000 horsepower, great aircraft, not worth a damn in combat. <laughs> but... Uh, <clears throat> We uh, we knew that we were again working with the uh, with the ground troops, and we would fill uh, little paper sacks with a white uh, with flour, and that was our bombing. Mm. We'd attack them at the bridgehead and throw toilet paper out and these little sacks full of of flour. And if you drape toilet paper over a bridge on the Nisqually River. The infantry couldn't use it anymore, so they had to get across the river some other way. And uh, mortars, uh, cross two by fours, served as a mortar. Um, cavalry on horses, we, they got lost, we had to go look for them. Uh, now that's in 1940. In June 44, as far as you could see, is American made equipment. Mm-hmm. Everything, not only what we were carrying, but we supplied the British and everyone else. And this magnificent effort by this magnificent country, and uh, you just—it's unbelievable when you think back. Uh, be, just before D-Day, as I say, every every little road was jammed with stored equipment. Can't imagine. It's a wonder the island didn't sink. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I've actually uh, on a recent podcast I was talking about the fact that m- many of American or or at least as much of America's victories in many cases have to be attributed to our ability to produce and make things and and America's incredible ability to like you said build such incredible equipment in such a short amount oh, of time. It's it's, it's epic. A, it's, it really was, and we switched from uh, isolation. Henry Ford was an isolationist, as I understand, and he turns around and builds a bomber plant that's turning out six, seven, eight, ten B-24s a day. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, this fantastic effort, but we all stood together in those days. Yeah, when, when. Um I always read that for D-Day, they they wanted troops, not all, but they were looking for, they, they brought a lot of troops that didn't have any combat experience. Well, it, I don't think uh, 5% of the people that hit the beaches had experience. You know, it's funny, I got in trouble in Paris uh, a few years ago. This ought to ago. be good. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a good story. My wife can hear it. <laughs> she was there, in fact. <laughs> but uh, we were at a dinner in Paris, um, D-Day celebration, and um, I made a mistake. I stood up and said to the people in the room that the ground troops here, the infantry, um, all you people that landed on D-Day, I said, D-Day is your day. It's not the Air Force's day. The missions we flew on D-Day were what we'd been doing for two years out of England. And it was, there was no better, no worse. But when you stop and think of those kids that hit that beach, no experience, uh, officers, no experience in combat. And so, in my opinion, and I'll stand by it, and I had a few people at the dinner who objected to what I said, but D-Day was the guys that hit the beach. We, uh, we supported them, but we didn't do much more than what we have been doing day after day. 
Um, you know, you can talk about the 8th Air Force and the heavy bombers and the fact that their, their losses were heavier than the total Marine loss in World War II. So we, we've been hurt, but uh, D-Day, uh, it belonged to those youngsters. What was the, because these, these guys were so, you know, were inexperienced, when you were out at a pub in England talking to these army guys that were getting ready to go in, were, were they just 100% fired up to go? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the only thing because I, I can imagine myself when I was 18 or 19 years old I first was in the military if you would have told me I was going to do a giant amphibious landing an epic amphibious landing there would have been just nothing but um, absolute motivation and, and excitement <laughs> from me because I was young and stupid and <laughs> and didn't know any better well, you know I mean, we, we were all young and y- yeah i guess i guess at some point young and stupid goes a long way doesn't it <laughs> well i can tell you a little story about that i was um, i was at camp kilmer uh, we were in fact we thought we were going to fly across uh, to england out of we we expected air transportation for there were a group of about 18 pilots and uh, i think we were, were set to fly, and all of a sudden, they gave us uh, all this equipment and um, uh, leggings and backpacks and helmet and all this stuff. Th- that, and, that kind of stuff makes pilots nervous, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it not only made us nervous, made damn fools out of us. <laughs> Nobody knew how to use this stuff. And I know I got the leggings on, uh, and I know they were from World War I, they gave me this backpack and, and all of this gas, uh, underwear and everything, and they didn't tell us how to pack it. And I went out behind the barracks, and there was a clothesline back there, and I got some clothesline, and I tied this damn pack up with clothesline. And um, they gave me a helmet, and I never tried it on. <laughs> so that, that evening... Get, get ready, and we start marching down some tour to the gates of the Camp Kilmer. They load us uh, on trucks, and we're over getting on the Queen Elizabeth. And you had to go down a pier and then up a whole bunch of stairs to get to, into the entrance to the ship. And I had a P4 bag with all of my clothes and everything, and I had a bottle of scotch in there. <laughs> and I packed very carefully, and I had a portable radio. And the portable radios in those days were like 36 inches long and full of batteries and everything. So I'm carrying this thing, and they gave me this damn helmet, but they didn't give me the interior of it. And so this damn, without the inside of it every time i took a step it was coming down and hitting me on the nose and then bouncing back back again we go up the stairs and someplace along the line i set that bag down too long and now i got scotch (laughs) draining out the bottom of my before bag and we we come to where they're checking us in, and there's a full colonel, army colonel standing there, <laughs> and he says, "My God, we're going to lose the war." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's unbelievable. Uh, uh, so there you go. We got people that don't know how to wear their helmets, pack their bags filled with scotch, <laughs> heading over to war. <laughs> uh, so, but when you're when you're talking to guys, they're 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 ready to go, and D Day commences, and they they just don't, you know, they don't know they don't understand what they're getting into yet. And and again, maybe to the credit of the planners. They decided it's better to have a bunch of guys that aren't really 100% sure of what to expect than it is to have a bunch of people that know what they're getting into and know how hard this is going to be. 
Well, that, that's very, in fact, what I started to say before I got off again, you have to watch me very carefully. Uh, <laughs> Wait, do you on, have scotch in your story. bag down there? <laughs> <laughs> but we go down to the officers club just before uh, we were going to take off for England, and there's quite a party going, and, and there was a little spirits flowing. And if you... The World War II barracks buildings where the club was, they had a mezzanine on the second floor, and then it's open in the center. And all these damn fools from the Airborne are up on the second floor yelling Geronimo and jumping off. (laughs) And this one kid broke his leg. And so uh, I've heard about guys breaking their leg and then going on to combat. That's another story (laughs) Uh, from my friend Charlie Plump. (laughs) What's that one about? (laughs) Oh, brother. (laughs) We got so many stories to tell you. I was on my way to combat on the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. We stopped in Hawaii for our last hoorah. And uh, so we went out and uh, found some pubs and whatnot. Well, I had rented a little um, a motor scooter, you know, like a little Vespa. Yeah. All right. And because uh, that's going to work out well. Yeah, that's going to work out well. <laughs> so I'm driving around um, Honolulu and I look back and when I look uh, forward, I'm uh, bore sighted on an 18 wheeler, and so I uh, so so I laid that, <clears throat> that motor scooter on its uh, side and slid underneath the axle of this truck, and pinned my uh, right ankle between the the frame of the motor scooter and the truck. Well, and so I you know I I, I came out and dusted myself off. I'm thinking, okay, and then I tried to walk. You know, I'm not walking very well, and so I, I go up to the closest uh, house and knock on the door. <laughs> And say, uh, you know, I, I guess I need a ride to the hospital. I went over to Tripler, hospital, big hospital in Hawaii. And, um, and the doc uh, there <clears throat> looks at me and he uh, takes an x-ray of my leg. And, and you know, it, it was really funny when you, when you see an x-ray of a broken part of your body, you know, you, you, you're in disbelief. You know, you're like, wait, how can this happen? You know, you're in denial. And the guy said, uh, okay, report to uh, uh, wing uh, Bravo uh, floor three. I said, what's on Bravo three? He said, it's all the other idiots that broke their leg (laughs) riding motor scooters in Hawaii. And sure enough, all these military guys in this military hospital had broken their leg on motor scooters. And so uh, I said, I can't do that. I'm, I'm a fighter pilot, you know. I just to help start the top gun school. I gotta, I gotta get out of here. I gotta go win the war, you know. <laughs> and and it, I'll never forget this doctor. <laughs> His name was Jensen. Doctor Jensen said, "Son, take my advice. Um, you, you can get into war in six months or so after your leg heals." And so. I said, I can't do that. I got to go back to the ship. He said, he said, you can't ride around on a ship with a broken leg. I said, no, an aircraft carrier. We've got hospitals and x-ray machines and all this good stuff. We got doctors and surgeons and all this stuff. Oh, no, I can't let you do that. You know, re- 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 report to all the other characters that broke their legs. No, no, I can't do that. So I find I, I'm arguing with this doctor who outranked me by about three ranks. And uh, uh, I said, tell you what, let me call the ship. I'll, I'll, I'll let you talk to uh, our flight surgeon, and he can assure you that I'll be okay by going back to the ship because I got to go to the war. <laughs> well, so, I, so I called the ship. Well, of course, the flight surgeon out getting drunk too, you know. <laughs> he, 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 so he wasn't there. And in fact, the only one in sick bay on that ship was a was a a, a corpsman, uh, like a third class corpsman. Okay, and he doesn't know what he's doing. And but I, I say, okay, I'm whispering to the guy. So okay, now tell tell this doctor that that you're in charge of the hospital and that it's okay for me to come back. So sure enough, you know he does what I say. <laughs> he tells the doctor. So so I get a cab. And I got this cast on now from my from my waist all the way up down to my toe. I got my big toes. I mean, how, I, I, I broke my ankle, you know, not, not the rest of my leg, but I got this 20-pound cast on. And so I got these crutches, and I crutch up the gangway, you know, and salute, uh, request permission to come aboard. And the, 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 the OD says, yeah, permission granted. And, and, and I hobble my way into uh, the sick bay. Okay, here's the same third-class corpsman sitting there, uh, and he doesn't know what he's doing, and he doesn't sign me in or anything. He says, uh, you know, go to the officer's quiet room. That We got one of those in sickbay, and so I crutch my way back to the quiet room, 
and I, I am exhausted. I'm totally, and this leg is starting to swell inside the cast, and I'm in pain. And so I just flop down in this, in this rack, okay, in the quiet room. Well, the next thing I hear is the engines of the ship starting up. You know, we're about to leave. Now, meanwhile, my squadron buddies, you know, wanting to leave no man behind, says, where's Charlie? Mm. They went back on the beach searching for me for the last place they saw me was disappearing towards Diamond Head on a Vespa. (laughs) (laughs) And so they look all over for me and come back and report that I'm AWOL. I miss ship's movement. All right. Okay, so I, I so I wake up and I, and I, and I know what's happening. I get, you know I got to tell somebody I'm here. Nobody knows I'm here. I mean, you know, the third class corpsman he didn't sign me in. He didn't know who I was. Mm. Okay, <laughs> so so I, you know you have these squeeze bottles, you know, in in, in a hospital room, and it's supposed to. Uh, so I'm squeezing on this bottle, trying to attract a nurse or something, you know, at the end there. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. And I finally looked up, and the hose from the bottle was cut. I would just squeeze in air. <laughs> so I get my crutch out, which is the only thing I can move. I mean, I'm paralyzed and I'm banging on the, the hatch, you know, and I tr- finally attract the uh, attention of this sailor. And I say, you better go up to the ready room in squadron 114 and uh, you better tell him up there that I'm down here. Well, it wasn't probably two minutes later, uh, the commanding officer standing in the doorway, all right? And he is not happy. <laughs> he said, I've got 17 pilots. He said, and now i got 16. He said, he said, first of all, he said, what are they telling you? When are you going to be ready to fly again? I said, six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, weeks, months, I kind of got that confused. And he said, you're going home. Ooh, I'm going to get a replacement pilot to you. Oh, no, please, please, please let me stay. i got to stay with the squadron. You know, i got to be with the troops, you know, please. And so now you're going home. Oh, please, please. I said, okay, okay uh, Skipper, what if I, uh, you need, you need a, a pilot from the squadron to run the, the maintenance on uh, 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 QB Point in the Philippines, you know, uh, a pilot stand behind it for battle damage and stuff you know i'll take care and i'll run those troops and for you i can do that on a crutch and so he said okay so he let me um he let me off uh at uh, on the philippines and while the rest of the squadron you know went to the war the first line period uh they went out there and and i'm crutching my way around the philippines uh with a you know i had i had probably uh, six or eight chiefs and um a hundred uh, mechanics, you know, working on these airplanes. Well, <clears throat> so they would send these airplanes back to me, but I didn't have any way to test them. Uh, but the, the army at Trip or Hospital had not taken my wings. They, they, they'd not given me a, a, a down shit, so I so told me I couldn't fly. Mm. Why? Well, you know, I, so I talked the doctor there at uh, Subic Bay to put on a walking cast. Okay, so I got a little cast. And so... Uh, I can, you know, I'm qualified to test these airplanes. I can do this. <laughs> so the problem was, first of all, I couldn't get into the airplane because my cast was too big to go into to the tow hole. And so I'd have a, my, my crew um, forklift me up and into the airplane. <laughs> my second problem was I couldn't use my right foot to, 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 to push the right rudder. And, and this, is a, this is kind of a nose wheel steering airplane, the F-4, where you got to be able to push the rudder to steer. So I would, I'd go out and test these airplanes, and I'd come back and land <clears throat> at, uh, at QB Point in the Philippines. And instead of making, the, they'd say, okay, you're, you're cleared right-hand turn. I couldn't make a right-hand turn. I made three left-hand turns <laughs> to get off the runway. <laughs> so the, the, the squadron finally came back, and, and I got back with them, got my little cast off, and I started flying missions. But you, until the day I was shot down, I was still limping on that ankle. And I was really afraid with a diet in the prison camp that that was never going to heal. But, uh, you know, as, as, as luck and, and fate would have it, it, it healed up fine. And so, you know, it, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's my story of, of, of getting, breaking my leg on the way to combat. <laughs> yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Jim. <laughs> uh, you know, let's, let's, we're talking about, now we're talking about getting shot down. You know, you ended up in a prison camp. Let's, you, you were about to get to the, to the, to the engagement where you actually did get shot down. You want to talk through that one a, a little bit further, Jim, and just 
give us some details on that? Well, sure. It, um, some of the details um, uh, are not original, but uh, uh, back to the, uh, the Purple Heart Corner, uh, you spot them coming in again, and this time there were two different gaggles that I could see, and the gaggle is a word that we use for the Germans because they didn't fly a real tight formation. They kind of, they were just there. Was that, was that intentional? Yes, it must have been because so, they were, you know, the German pilots are sharp pilots. Yeah. But um, I would guess, uh, you especially know, in Germans are generally orderly people, so you'd think they'd want to fly tight formations. But I, I guess if you think about it from a, from like even from a basic camouflage perspective, when you see things in a pattern, it stands out more. So maybe they did that to break up their pattern a little bit. Well, I would assume that because they were very effective and... Um, you know, some of these boys you we'd run into were, had been at it for a long time. And, but as I saw them coming in and as, referred to them, as I said, as a gaggle, uh, I picked the one closest and broke into it, made the call that I was making the break, and broke. And just as I broke, somebody got a shot at me, and I got hit back in the aft part of the fuselage, and I, I thought I had a little fire going, and I'm sure I did. But um, as I made my first pass through them, I lined up, and if you could get the P-38 nose on a target, those 450s and that 20 millimeter were devastating. And so, How many rounds of 50 cal would you have? We usually carry 400 rounds per gun and 130 rounds of uh, 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 20 millimeter. Yeah. And we arranged our, uh, uh, our triggers so that you, we, we wanted to fire them all at the same time. We didn't carry any tracer. We, had, we put five tracers in at about 25 rounds remaining so that you knew you were you had to have something to go home on to right. uh, start conserving your ammunition. And so I got a, a, a line on a, a clear shot. I fired at him, but I, don't, I didn't know what the results were because all of a sudden I'm in the middle of a, of a firestorm. Uh, a literal firestorm inside your cabin, inside your cockpit? No, or just uh, still outside just, the plane. Just outside the okay. aircraft, uh, there were there were lots of targets, and uh, apparently I went through them. Uh, really, at this late date uh, in my story, it's how much I really remember about this. Uh, I heard stories later, which I'll get to, but uh, uh, it seemed like it went on forever. And uh, finally, uh, I'm on the tail of a 190. I saw, I, I saw some, I knew I was involved with 190s, but I saw a couple 109s someplace in my peripheral vision. So there were, uh, there were other aircraft involved, and they're all, apparently they're all with me. I didn't know it at the time. But um, uh, we made a, num a number of, passes I was very concerned about the amount of ammunition you know if you hold it that fire button down you're, you're going to be out in about 20 seconds so I was very concerned about using all my ammunition so I was trying to fire very short bursts and um, we go round and round and we're uh, yo-yoing up and down and and uh, uh, I'm Got on the tail of a 190. Again, I'm right up on top of him. Uh, and when the P-38 threw your gun sight, you could also see your two top 50s. Uh, and it looked like I had those two 50s right around the rudder post of this 190. And out of the corner of my eye, I see these flashes out on my wingtip, and they're coming up the wingtip, <laughs> and they're getting closer and closer, and this is milliseconds. Yeah. And he hit me right in, in by the, the left engine, and um, we had an air, uh, uh, air scoop that came in through the leading edge of the wing, 
and into the cockpit by your left knee, which is our only cold air into the P-38. And again, I see this in the peripheral vision, and I'm concentrating on the guy in front of me. Uh, I see this air vent making like a blowtorch. <laughs> and so this is not good. <laughs> and no. No. again, uh, my next memory is I'm out falling through a cloud. I don't remember, our emergency reliefs was above us. P-38 had actually had windows, and you crank them up on both sides, and the only way you could get them down is to hit the little release and then crank them down. And so we had a top hatch, which was our escape hatch, which is about this wide, and you have a backpack shoot on and all the equipment. And I, um, uh, I don't know. I don't remember releasing anything or pulling the uh, the safety belt or the shoulder harnesses. Uh, but this I, is unlike you know Charlie. You're you know the modern rigs where you pull the ejection handle. And you, this was all stuff. I mean, in a modern aircraft, you pull the ejection handle and you're getting shot out of the aircraft. It's all automatic. That's right. All yeah. that's all you do. Yeah. So, we we didn't have to think about anything. We weren't smart as as these guys were. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 this was all stuff you manually had to do. Unbuckle yourself. Get and open up the hatch or the window and and get all that done while the the plane is burning and and then you have to get out and that's kind of when you come back into consciousness so you did that either instinctively or or at some point while all this mayhem was going on that's right i don't as i say i don't remember even reaching up above for the to pull the the top hatch um well i was just out floating down through, a, I knew the clouds were around 5,000 feet because we'd been yo-yoing up and down during this time. And, and also, just one more point, on a ejection sheet, a modern ejection sheet, you come out, your parachute opens automatically, right? Oh, yes. So you're you're still in a ripcord scenario, oh, yes. right? Where you're going to have to make this <laughs> parachute open. So when you, say, when you say you're floating down, you're actually falling down at 120 miles per hour towards the earth. Somewhat like that. <laughs> So anyway, I come out the bottom of the cloud, and I'm facing up. And I thought, well, I better turn over. <laughs> so I, I turned over, and I can remember distinctly watching the ground. And I thought I was behind German lines because we were at Aachen, Germany. And uh, uh, I just knew that I was, and we were east of Aachen. And I knew where approximately where this fight started, and I didn't think it had gotten any better about going west, so I, I figured we were over, we were over German territory, and so uh, we um, we had been told to not pull your ripcord at altitude, get down, because you're a, <laughs> you're a lot less of target the lower you can get. So I rolled over and fell actually just fell face down and watched the ground come up when it looked like it was pretty close i pulled a rip cord and it, this is your first time parachuting or did did you guys do any parachuting in preparation for this oh no, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> okay um yeah that's interesting having having jumped out of a, at least a decent number of airplanes this is not something you want to do for the first time <laughs> in, under these well, you circumstances don't want to do it again either. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway it's a uh, ripcord at work and um uh i remember thinking well you know i got to be ready to move when when i get down so I unbuckled the two lower straps on the, the chute, and I got them unbuckled, and I had a 45 in the shoulder holster, and I got the 45 out, and I'm trying to cock it to get around in the chamber, and I dropped it. And I didn't realize my hands were burned. And so I'm not sure how I got the, the chute uh, buckles off. And so I must have been pretty low when I pulled a rip card because just instantaneously, I. There's, I came down in a red brick building, and it had a uh, courtyard 
in a tree in the middle of the courtyard, and I could, if I could find the building, I'd recognize it today. And my shoe caught in this little tree, and I jerked to a stop, and I'm probably six inches off the off the deck. And um, I remember doing that, but then I don't remember uh, for a period. Uh, and I, I kept thinking, it's getting dark. And I thought, well, God, I've been, you know, where have I been? And uh, I'm going down what I, was like a little hedgerow, and I had my 45. And I saw these guys down in this ditch. Uh, boy, I, I thought they were German. And I saw they had a uh, net on their helmet, and our guys had a net on the helmet. And I, I threw my hands up and threw the 45 over my shoulder, never saw it again. But um, it was 1st Infantry Division, and they um, had seen my shoot, and I came down between the German positions and 1st Infantry Division. Wow. And what had happened, and I found this all later, they, 1st uh, Infantry, we were trying to take Aachen. You know, we started, and this is mid-September, to try to take Aachen. We didn't get Aachen until... Uh, early November, where we actually took the town. And the 1st Infantry had pushed up during, on the night of the 15th. They had pushed up and taken this little area uh, where I came down. It was a little town called Ellendorf, which was a suburb of, of Aachen. And they were having trouble holding it. And so they were getting ready to pull back, and they saw my chute, and the guys came out and uh, picked me up and took me to a, a VAC hospital. But before they did that, uh, they took me in and uh, into an area, and I was in a command post, and I met a full colonel. And I found out later who he was. He was the... Uh, commander of the 16th Infantry Regiment, and he he said he asked me if you wanted dinner, and I said well, I, I I don't know what I said. Anyway, I apparently sat down and had dinner with him or ate with him, and uh, I do remember going outside this area and throwing it up, so <laughs> I knew I I had eaten something. But uh, they um, put me in a, a, a two and a half ton truck. And where they put the uh, uh, the stretchers, they put them in between the, the, the whatever the side gates, and I there was some Germans in there and some Americans and me, <laughs> and they hauled us back. And I, they took me to what I found out later was the 45th the back hospital, and um, they treated me there. But uh, I. Uh, Right at that moment, I don't remember too much about all this going on, except I thought it was getting dark. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd been on the ground for quite a while. And I found out later that my eyes were had been pretty flash burns in my face and hands and everything. And I, was, I couldn't see for a couple of days. So apparently I was having, my eyes were swelling shut or something, and I'm, I, I think it's getting dark. Mm -hmm. But um, they hauled me into the, the, uh, the hospital, and I was very fortunate. They had a doctor there who uh, either had developed or was using a new technique on burns. And they took me in the, uh, this operating room, and it was colder in hell, and I'm vibrating like blazes, and they start picking like this. And uh, God, this is going to drive me crazy. <laughs> and what it was, they developed this new technique where they pick the, all the burn areas out to get it off there. So you, you heal from, from the inside out. And as I went back through the, the hospital system, uh, they'd use me as a, a, a demonstration to these kids that have been caught in tanks and badly burned, much worse than I was, and they were telling them that, look what we did here, look how quickly he's healing, meaning me, uh, using this technique. 
And um, so apparently I was one of the very first that they'd ever used this song. But when um, we, uh, we, we were put on this train, the uh, hospital train, and taken to the American Hospital in Paris, and they haul me in, in there, and this guy comes up to me and he says, hell, I know you. Uh, he says, we picked you up. <laughs> and his name was Walter, uh, Leonard Scott. He was a, a, uh, with the 1st Infantry Division, Company C, and he was the second lieutenant. And um, he became my friend. He stayed with me for quite a while, and he had witnessed almost all of this operation as we yo-yoed around the area while he, he was seeing a good part. And then he told me a lot about what happened. They, they told me that um, they estimated there were 20, en 20 enemy aircraft, and that somehow or other that story has stuck in, with, uh, with my story. I don't, I don't know what they were. I mean, uh, he, um, uh, he, he actually uh, uh, was where I got most of my information about what had gone on. So we, um, we went through the hospital chain, and, and you know, was uh, was he in the hospital for something? Had he been injured as well? <laughs> yeah, he. We get to England, and he's telling me a little bit about uh, infantry life, and he had landed with the First Infantry Division in North Africa. <sighs> he went all through North Africa, and went to Sicily, and um, he had been very badly wounded in Sicily, and they, um, he and another officer had uh, manned an anti-tank gun uh, in some big operation in Sicily, and the two of them uh, stayed with this anti-tank gun when everybody else had departed, and anyway, he had received a Distinguished Service Cross. And that was the first time I ever heard the term Distinguished Service Cross. And so now I'm starting. He started in 42, and he uh, went through North Africa. He went to Sicily. He went to England. He made D-Day. And wow. uh, yeah, I said, well, how come you're still a second lieutenant? <laughs> 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 well, we... We hadn't been in, we were sent to England. They, they took us to the Netley Hospital, which was this gigantic hospital right outside of Southampton that had been built in the Boer Wars, something like that big, looked like a castle. And so we hadn't been in there two hours, and this cute little nurse shows up with a Class A uniform for Leonard Scott, and Scott was gone. I mean, we didn't see him for 10 days. <laughs> so I figured that Leonard Scott was probably a first lieutenant four or five times. <laughs> it sounds like from the cute nurse, it might have been worth it to no, stay at that I'm rank. sure it was. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we were quite close for just a few weeks. And for years and years and years, I tried to find Leonard Scott. I knew that he made it through the war. I knew that uh, he'd gotten off, separated from active duty and at Fort Lewis. And he was from the Dalles, Oregon. And I tried to find him. And about a year ago, uh, my wife sat down at the computer. And in a matter of uh, a couple hours, she finds his two, uh, his two uh, daughters. <laughs> And he had passed, he had gone through Korea, he went back on active duty, went through Korea. He was, um, uh, he had this distinguished service cross. He had the Purple Heart with seven clusters. Jeez. And he had been hit, uh, he said he made the D Day landing, and in 20 minutes he was on a, uh, a landing craft on his way back to England. He'd gotten hit that quickly. Wow. And then he, the day after I was shot down, he got hit again. And he went back um, 
after we separated, he went back to the 1st Infantry Division, Company C. And it's funny, uh, coming up to more recent times, uh, I built a number, I, I, I used to build, uh, we still build airport facilities, but I used to build air cargo buildings and so forth and lease them to the airlines. And I did a lot of work with Flying Tigers. And I knew Bob Prescott pretty well, who was the uh, president of Tigers. And I knew uh, uh, Wayne Hoffman, who was the chairman of the board of Tigers. So tell us a little bit about the Flying Tigers, if people don't know. Uh, the Flying Tigers is an airline. A uh, cargo airline that uh, was sold to Federal Express and is now part of Federal Express. And Tigers was named uh, because Bob Prescott, who was president of Tigers, had flown with the Flying Tiger organization in China, one of the original Flying Tigers. And at, right after the war, he started a little airline and called it Flying Tigers. And it became a gigantic air cargo facility and they were flying all over the world. And so I started building facilities and leasing to them. And so I uh, knew Bob and knew Wayne Hoffman real well. And I knew that Wayne Hoffman had been a, uh, in the Army and been a, uh, uh, in the infantry, but that's, we never talked about it. And uh, Wayne's wife uh, wrote a, a book and she took all of Wayne's letters that he had written home from Europe during the war and put them in this book. And so they gave me a book and I read it and I come to September 16th. Uh, Wayne Hoffman is in Ellendorf, Germany in uh, the first part of the Siegfried line. Uh, five o'clock in the evening in his letter to his wife he said, a very short letter. He said, um, I'm in Ellendorf, and there's an air battle going on above us. And we get talking, and that was me. Yeah. And here we'd been friends for a, a, a number of years, and we'd never really talked about it. And he was uh, Company D of the 16th Regiment. Leonard Scott was Company C of the 16th Regiment. And we never put all this together. That's amazing. That's, that's amazing. Unbelievable. So, and it, it's amazing what comes out. And I found out that um, uh, two of the people that on the German side that I've been involved with, uh, uh, a current a uh, major Boris. Uh, they. This is a long story. I don't know how far you want to go with this. We go as long as you want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they, um, uh, Major Boris, uh, uh, well, I'll go back a, a step. I, I heard from a gentleman in Holland, and they had some information about my airplane. And this gentleman uh, had written several big historical books. And he lived in, uh, in that little area where Belgium and Holland and Germany all come together. And he had found like 500 wrecks, aircraft wrecks in this area, and traced them down in, in history and, and uh, recorded it. And they came up with a P-38 in uh, Ellendorf, Germany. And so they figured out and found that it was my airplane. And they found it in 1997. And so anyway, in a series of steps, I get in, they get in contact with me. And uh, he had studied uh, that, that air, air warfare in that area and was writing another book about that. And he, so he wanted to talk to me about it, and we did. But Unfortunately, he passed away, but uh, very early, he was a young man. And so I, I never got a souvenir from the wreck of my airplane. It's there someplace waiting for me if I can find it. But he told me that he, had, he came up with two names that 
uh, he had read this book by Caldwell. There's a story called The, the uh, War Diary of J.G. 26, the yellow-nosed, Abbeville boys, yellow-nosed uh, aircraft. And um, they, uh, he had written on September 16th, he had this story about attacking the, three, the 370th group and the, the Germans claimed uh, four P-38s had been shot down. And that wasn't true. I was the only one that lost. They actually attacked the group after my engagement with them. They finally got their act together, I guess, and attacked the group and didn't do too well. But like 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, whatever the time element. But he figured out that one of two people had shot me down. One fellow was, was uh, Major uh, Boris. Major Boris had shot down his first victory was uh, in 1939. He shot down a Spitfire. Mm. Uh, he had, if, if he got me, I was his 42nd victory. Wow. <laughs> the other guy was a fellow by the name of Keith Mueller. And uh, he, if he got me, I would have been his 82nd victory. <laughs> so these guys were not beginners. And um, so all this information is dribbling in over the last 60 years. So by the time I find out about Boris and, and the Luftwaffe, uh, they're, they've died. Mm -hmm. So I've never got a chance to talk with them. But through Scott, we found... Scott's uh, uh, daughter is a very famous uh, interior decorator in San Francisco. And so we're going to get together with her. And she said that uh, her father passed away at a very early age. I think he was in his 50s. Mm. But so all of this just keeps coming in. We keep hearing more and more. You find something will accidentally uh, uh, be unearthed or... Interesting stories there, Jim, but you haven't told us about the nurse. <laughs> um, Helping you with your clothes. Oh, the nurse. <laughs> <laughs> this is a G-rated podcast <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> uh, Come on, well, there, uh, yeah. Echo can, Echo can uh, you know, bleep some of it out, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. There were some lovely nurses. <laughs> and they well, I think we all know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were, you know, they were so wonderful. I mean, well, these gals were just unbelievable how they took care of you. <laughs> yeah. No, it's actually, uh, you know, we've read some books on the podcast where there was nurses that were over in France and they were receiving guys right off the front lines. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they had me on this 45th, and I wake up, and I'm hearing all of this big bang and going on. Well, the, the 45th hospital is here, and there's a, right behind it here, there's a 105th, 105 uh, artillery oh. <laughs> firing over the, the hospital. <laughs> and uh, they took me to, from there I went to... Um, uh, the hospital, uh, the general hospital in uh, in, Bru in Brussels. No, not Brussels. Where the hell? Man uh, Maastricht. And uh, I left there one day, and then the next day after I left, uh, a V a V one uh, rocket, rocket. Thing flew right into the side of the hospital there, mm. and I have pictures of it that I took. This is later, my second tour through the hospital, which is another story. But uh, uh, so that, that was a big tragedy. They mm -hmm. killed a number of the people and hit one of the wards. Uh, so, and, and those, those were nurses that I knew. Mm -hmm. but How long did it take you to recover? And did, did you fly again or was that, was being shot down and, and wounded, was that the end of the war for you? No, well, it was in combat, really. Um, uh, I went through the hospital chain, and uh, I uh, was released in England. Went back, uh, I was going through Paris, and, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> when the hospitals would collect the uniforms. 
they took all my flying jacket and everything was burned from the wreck. So it's all, they strip you down and throw it all away. And so now I'm in a hospital in England and they're going to let, release me and I'm going back to my squadron. I'm ready to fly. This is in November. And uh, uh, my burns had healed pretty well. And so they give me a uniform to, to wear. And I don't know how many guys uh, or how many times this guy, whoever's uniform it was, had been hit, but there was a, sure a bunch of holes in it that they had <laughs> matched up. And I found a hat, and so I had no money. And so I'm, I'm treating my way back. I went to London, and then I got a flight to Paris, and I got to Paris, and so I decided, well, I'm in Paris, and I'm on my way back to the squadron. Uh, I'm going to see something. So I went down to the Lido Club, and um, I used to like, I still like to dance, but I, I like swing. And so I'm in the Lido Club, and, and they have this pretty little gal singing uh, uh, some French tunes, and then they want to, they ask, a few people if they wanted to do a little jitterbug. <laughs> so we, uh, we had quite a night. And so I left early and I'm figuring on where I'm going to sleep. And I'm walking down the avenue and here comes a gaggle again of, of uh, guys with pinks on and the, the green jerseys and everything. Damn, here comes my battle jacket my pants, these are all friends of mine, and they're wearing my clothes. <laughs> my clothes. <laughs> so I, they, they were staying at the Claridge Hotel right next to the Lido Club. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I'm better dressed. <laughs> and I, I borrowed some money, and, and uh, we enjoyed Paris. And then did you get back to the squadron? Went back to the squadron with them. And, they and had transportation, so I went back with them. And I'm there for, God, I walked in, and everybody's glad to see me. And, and um, they say, God, we just got a brand new P-38 in, right from Ireland. Just came through. It's yours. And, boy, it was a beauty. So I'm all ready to start flying again. And Doc Berg, who was our flight, <laughs> he comes to me, and he says, Jimmy says, I don't like the way you're walking. And I said, well, I'm just a little bit sore, but everything's fine. And he said, well, we're going over to, we were at A70, or A78 at that time in Florenz, Belgium. He says, we'll go over to Chalera and, and just check you out. And so I go over to the hospital at Chalera with him. And the next thing you knew, I got a cast from here down to my rear end. Hmm. And they x-rayed me, and, and I had a broken back that they hadn't treated. Hmm. So uh, back to the hospital. And so we, I went through that, went back to the third military. Uh, uh, well, they had a, what they did is they had a, a central med uh, medical section and they run all the pilots through there and then they would determine what happens to you. And so I kept saying, well, I want to go back to the squadron. And so they said, okay, we're going to, you got your cast. And then they took the big cast off and put a small one on. They said, we're going to send you to England for at least 30 days to a flak house. Well, flak houses is where they run by the uh, uh, Red Cross. And mainly were for bomber crews. Mm -hmm. If the bomber crew had, we getting a little nervous or something, they'd send them down for a week or so. And so they sent me to this black house. And the first thing I get in trouble with, with the Red Cross, is fighter pilots like to talk about combat and flying. And these bomber guys didn't want to have anything to do with that kind of conversation. So the Red Cross gets upset with me, and they tell me i got to keep my mouth shut. And I said, well, fine, I'll keep my mouth shut. But... I'm going to do this. Give me a set of orders, and I'll go off to some base because I'm I can walk. So I I had a little plan. You used to, to get your flying time, your pay. 
you had to fly four hours a month. So I would ha I'd write a set of orders and said that I, I'm just temporary duty and I, I, want, I want four hours uh, flying time. So I'd go off to some base and with, with a small cast on and uh, uh, I'd say, I'd walk in and say, here's my orders. I need four hours flying time. And so they'd arrange and I'd fly for four hours and and go back to the flak house, and a couple of days later, I'd write some more orders and go someplace else. So I got to fly a number of aircraft while I was there, and so pretty soon, my 30 days are over, I go back to third medical, and um, they send me back to the squadron, and Doc Berg was not happy to see me at all, and at that time, I got orders to report to General Spots headquarters in, in Paris. And they said, um, they didn't tell me what I was going down there for. And some colonel came, uh, came to the squadron. He's also assigned on this same deal, same set of orders. And so we go down to Paris together. And uh, his name was Ingolito, and he ended up a two or three star general. He had decorations from his neck down to his waist already. And so uh, I get down to Paris, and I'm going to get the Distinguished Service Cross. Well, outside of uh, Leonard Scott, who never really told me what the Distinguished Service Cross was, I wasn't sure what we were about to get. And um, anyway, we, we got that and went back to the squadron again, thinking everything at least is pretty close to right, and Berg says, you're going home. <laughs> and so that was the end of that, except I'm grounded. And, and, and that's why I'm going home, I'm grounded. And so I had, I had all these records with me, and you know, we, officers then, I suppose they still do, you carried your own records with you. So I'm going home, grounded, and I got my records, well, I still have those records, and they're in a footlocker down in my hangar. Nobody else ever got them. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got home and took a medical and passed it, and so I'm back on flying duty. The war's still on. Uh, it looks like we could might be uh, uh, going to, out to the Pacific mm -hmm. to make the invasion of Japan. Uh, I'm flying the latest P-51, P-51H. Uh, got married and uh, with my childhood sweetheart, who I met when she was 15. And uh, everything is right in the world. And, and Harry Druman dropped the bomb and, <laughs> and ruined a perfectly good war. <laughs> <laughs> so... That and was just about it. I stayed in until 1948, and I got to fly our first jets and, and had a wonderful time, had a wonderful experience, learned a heck of a lot, I got to do things that would have never happened to me and if we hadn't have gotten involved in all of this. So it worked out great. And so how did you two end up uh, meeting? Well, I had this old antique airplane, and uh, I was looking for a hangar for this airplane, and, uh, and Jim was building hangars at the time, and this little, little bitty airport up in the valley above Santa Barbara called Santa Inez, and he helped me um, build a hangar, and uh, it, it was kind of interesting, the attraction, and in, in fact, my wife brought this up. He said, she said, you know, you're going to have three generations of warriors talking on these telephones. I mean, today on this podcast, uh, you got uh, Jim Kunkel and 30 years later, you got Charlie Plum and 30 years later, you got Jock, Jocko Willink. He said, and there's a, there's a certain attraction with warriors. I don't know what it is with our brains, you know, but there's some kind of a, kind of a magnetism or something. You just kind of identify with other guys that have been in combat. And so even though there, I don't know, there are probably 100 pilots on this airport, uh, Jim and I kind of hit it off without even knowing uh, our history. 
Uh, and the more we got to know each other, this is like 20 years ago, the more we got to know each other, the more uh, similar philosophies of life, you know, we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's not just our flying, because Jim still flies, of course I still fly, and, uh, and of course I've got an old antique airplane that uh, uh, from his training days, uh, and uh, but more than that, the technology has changed, the the enemy has changed uh, from World War II to Vietnam to Iraq, you know, uh, 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 the, but, the, but the camaraderie of military guys, you know, there's just something. And, and a lot of stuff that you talk about, Jocko, uh, in your podcast and in your books, just the, you know, the fact that you, we're all accountable. We're, we're responsible, not just for our lives, but for our buddies. And there's something about that, that community of warriors uh, that, that really connects. So that's how Jim and I got started. He built the hangar for me, and, uh, and, and I moved in. My wife uh, made a, a man cave out of it. And so, uh, so, so, I mean, that, that, that's where we are. We're, we're sitting here doing this. Yeah, that was, we, we, we joked about that on the first time you were on the podcast, that that you had the ultimate man cave. And you know, I kind of threw that out there, but now that I've been here, it is actually factually true that you do have the <laughs> ultimate man cave. And uh, I'm gonna take a gulp and take a bunch of pictures. Maybe we'll even do a video, like a little tour sure. of it, and sure. just show everyone kind of what this is all about. And and all the, I mean, the, the history that you have here, and the pictures and the photographs, mm -hmm. and, and the you know pieces of aircraft and everything else, is it's, it's phenomenal to look at. And you know, it was interesting, so when I got here, um, you know, we, you, we were walking around and, and, and Jim's hangar is a few hangers down. And you know, you said, hey, Jim wants to show you something. And, and I said, oh, well, you know, okay. You know, I, I didn't really have any idea what it was. So we, we get out and we walk from your hangar and we're walking down towards Jim, Jim's hangar. And uh, you know, we shake hands and I meet, I meet Jim for the first time. And he says, you know, I want to show you something. And I say, oh, okay, you know, neat. And he goes, it's a picture. And I said, oh, awesome. And I, and I have no idea what to expect. And he says, it's someone you know. And I said, okay, well, that narrows it down. But I don't know, you know, I don't know who I have in, in, in common, you know, with Jim or I don't know. I have no idea, no idea who this was or who this picture was going to be. So we go to Jim's man cave which is an each equally impressive and and awesome you know hanger with you know his personal effects and pictures and models and parts of aircraft and everything else and he walks into a corner and and he picks up a picture and he hands me this picture and the picture and I, I immediately i know who it is and it's it's this second lieutenant from the marine corps it's a picture of a young chinese american second lieutenant from the marine corps and it uh, it's it's Kurt Lee who I I talked about in podcast number fifty three, colder than hell, and I I went kind of off about him a little bit. I talked about him a lot because if you remember from this particular podcast and from that particular book, this was at the Chosen Reservoir, and and this second lieutenant Kurt Lee, he was while all of these guys are engaged in in just intense continuous combat in order to lead his men he fashioned a a fluorescent orange vest out of some signaling material and or out of some parachute material or something he made this vest for himself so that he would be completely visible to all of his men now that also means he's obviously completely visible to the enemy as well but that was what kind of a leader that this guy was, you, you look, I, I'm gonna take extra risk, but I'm, we're, I'm gonna make this happen, I'm in charge, you're gonna know where, where I am, and you can follow me through whatever. And it's an incredible story of, of heroism. So that's the picture that Jim puts in front of me, is this picture of, of Kurt Lee. And I, I kind of look at him, and, I, you know, and, and it turns out that you, that you knew Kurt Lee. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Kurt was a, a good friend, a dear friend, and uh, quite a story, and I had tremendous respect for him. I, I had tremendous respect for his principles to the last day of the, before he died, and uh, uh, fond memories. 
Yeah, it was. It's an interesting story too, because that's another thing that we talked about. Was in part of that what he did at one point in that book, and I don't remember it specifically, but he basically dresses someone down in the middle of a firefight for not giving him, you know, not calling him sir or not calling him lieutenant. And, you know, I'm kind of saying, hey guys, you know, you need to think about when the right time to do this is. But as you said, he was an extremely principled person and <laughs> kept those <laughs> yes, principles at all times. Well, you know, he, um, he led the, uh, the group of Marines uh, through the night to relieve Fox Company, which is quite a, a well-known story in the Marine Corps. Uh, Fox Company was holding a hill that commanded the escape route for the whole Chosin Reservoir group, Army, uh, uh, Marine Corps, and um, they, they were under heavy attack, and the, the idea was to get down and support them, and Kurt Lee, I could speak three or four different dialects of Chinese. And so he's leading these, he's the scout who is actually leading the whole contingent of Marines through the night, through heavy snow, uh, terrible, terrible conditions. And actually, as they came across uh, Chinese sentries, troops, he would talk to them in Chinese. And they got the whole, the whole contingent got through. And uh, uh, they made it in time. They relieved Fox Company. Uh, tremendous story. Yeah, it, it is unbelievable story. And unbelievable that you handed that picture to me and, and that you knew him. I mean, that's just this phenomenal, phenomenal situation. Um, was there anything, Charlie, that when, when you were on last time, was there anything that you know, I know we, we talked for a few hours, I think. Yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> was there any major things that as you listened to it again that you said to yourself, you know what, I should, I should talk about this as well? Not, uh, nothing which uh, specifically comes to mind, uh, but now that, you know, that the three uh, warriors are here together, you know, I think we should talk a little bit about philosophies of combat and the fears that we faced uh, because I think, you know, to the general public, the vast majority of your listeners and viewers uh, are not in the military. Uh, and so, you know, my, my thought is, well, how do they relate? Oh, it's interesting history. You know, I love the history of the greater generation. And uh, I, I love your history as well. And the things that are going on, to, to, you know, today that the guy's at the point of the, of the spear. But what does that mean to the, you know, to the average guy, you know, uh, who, who's never been in the military? There's some principles I believe that the three of us learned in combat that can, that's transferable, I think, to, to all challenges of life, you know, that... The, the, just, you know, the fact that you face your fears, you know, you step into the, into the box and, and Jim did it and you've done it, uh, where you, you could have run the other way, you know, you, you could have quit, uh, you, you could have checked out, but you know, I mean, all, all three of us felt like that we had a duty, a duty to our country, a duty to our brotherhood. Uh, and so we, you know, picked up the, picked up the baton and, and, and continued on. Um, and so, uh, you know, to, to me, that's sort of the important part, the part that you can, you can transfer more than just the military history that we all have, the, the philosophy uh, of meeting challenges. Because I'm convinced, you know, you, you, can, you can be in just as much of a, of a challenge uh, in your life. You don't, you don't have to be flying jet airplanes or running around with SEAL teams, um, you, you can face challenges when a person is diagnosed with cancer or loses a child or, for that matter, gets cut out of your lane on the freeway. Uh, you have a choice. And, uh, and the choice that you make de certainly depends uh, on not only uh, your character, but then it also uh, transmit into the outcome of the character that you continue to be in life. And so while we're you know, 30, 60 years apart in our, in our generations here, our philosophies of life and the warrior uh, psyche uh, continues. And so I, I, I'm just really, really proud to be a part of this and proud to be uh, uh, with you, Jocko, and of course with you, Jim. 
Jim and I see each other probably a couple times a month. We get together. We have dinner. Our, our wives, you know, cook good meals, and we go fly sometimes. And uh, and there's a certain silent language, I think, between us uh, that we don't even have to talk to each other, uh, and yet we understand what what's going on. You know, where where, where we're coming from, and the the accountability that that we share. Uh, just because of the experiences that we've had. I got asked a question the other day. I was working with a company. I was actually, no, it wasn't a, working with a company. I was doing a, a speech, and I was doing some Q&A at the end, and a guy asked me, how do you define character, and how do you build it? And I'd actually never been asked this question before, and quite frankly, I hadn't really thought about it very much. And And this guy had thought about it and I talked to him afterwards and it was something that he it was why he really wanted to hear me talk because he wanted to get my perspective on this and I answered the question like this I, I, I said you know for me character is not a very complex thing for me character is you do what's right you do what's right. You do the right thing. That's what you do. And if you do the right thing, regardless of what the consequences are, that, that represents character. And so then how do you build character? It's a beautiful thing because it's the same thing. If you want to build character, you do the right thing. You do the right thing for yourself. You do the right thing for your family. You do the right thing for your, the people that you know. You do the right thing for your community. You do the right thing for your country. That's what you do. And now. On an individual level, those things are hard things often, right? If those are hard things, you have to make the right decisions. You have to be, live a disciplined life. Those build character, those little things that you do on a daily basis to make yourself better, to improve your health, to improve your, your situation in life. You're doing those things, they're hard to do. And when you do those things, they build your character. And ultimately, they lead to your, your, your character being a good character as opposed to a bad one. But I'd never been asked that question before, and I thought that the simplicity of it is pretty clear when you think about it. You know, when you think about the people that you know, you know, when I think about the, the people that I worked for in the military or that worked for me, up or down the chain of command, what, what is it that made them people that, because, you know, there's bad character. You know, we, we can't sit here and pretend like everybody that just because you're in the military, you've got great character. That's absolutely not true. But what about those people? And I, I you know, I thought through this in, in three seconds as this guy asked me this question. You know, I thought to myself, well, what about the guys that I know that have good character that I look to and say, yeah, this, this person I trust, you know, without question, what kind of person is that? That's the person that you know is going to do the right thing all the time, regardless of the consequences. And a couple of things about that. First of all, it isn't easy. In fact, usually the right thing is the toughest thing. You know, it, it, it's, the, it's the hard decision. The second thing is it doesn't always turn out um, for the best mm -hmm. when you do the right thing. Lots of times we stumble, you know, and, and your listeners may think that the three of us, you know, have always, uh, you know, been on the top of the heap. But all three of us have fallen yeah. short, you know. I mean... Uh, I'll tell you this, uh, languishing in prison camp, the first, the first month in that prison camp, I laid there in, in, in blood and sweat and tears, and, uh, and, and my mental state was just in the tank because I'd given up. Fighter pilots are not supposed to give up. Jim and I weren't trained to, <laughs> to surrender. And, and my, my mental, my, the depression that I had just because of that, and I think that largely in life, you, you know, when you do do the right thing and it doesn't turn out right, then you have to get up, dust yourself off, get back in the back in the in the fray, and that's tough to do. You know, the last thing you want to do when 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 you're getting beat up every from every side and you really want to quit, the last thing you want to do is to is to stand up and and be forceful again to to you know to to take control of the situation. And yet, it's those kinds of challenges in life that build that character, you know, that, that really make the difference between, you know, the, 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 the positive life, uh, the life lived well, and those guys and gals that, uh, that don't make those kind of decisions. 
And you were talking about when you were when you were depressed, when you were laying there, it's because you felt like you had failed. Right. You felt like you had broken. You felt like you weren't the man that you thought you were. Mm-hmm. And they'd found your breaking point, and you'd found your breaking point, and mm-hmm. you didn't like that. Yep. And what, if I remember correctly, what 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 got you through that was you know you you went broke down and took one of your one of your cellmates and said, well, this is horrible. I'm a I'm a I'm a disaster. I'm a failure. I broke. And he kind of said, oh yeah, welcome to the club. We all break. It was like one of those mm-hmm. things. Yep. And yep. I think to your point. Absolutely, everyone, everyone has a point where they go, ah, you know, I, 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 I failed here. I mm-hmm. didn't do what I was supposed to do. I lacked the character that I needed at that time to, to be a good leader or to even stand up and fight one more time. I failed. And the point is, us all sitting around at this table and every single person that's listening to this right now, you can find a spot in your life where you said, you know what, I didn't do it. I didn't hold the line. I yep. my character broke yep. and I wasn't the person that I should have been at that moment. Mm-hmm. And that's that's absolutely true, but what's more important than the fact then that we all get to a point where we break is number 1 that everybody breaks and number 2 that doesn't mean it's over. That just mean that just it's a bump in the road. Mm-hmm. It's a bump in the road and mm-hmm. you got to rebuild from it, you got to come back and you can you can do that. And not only that, but largely that bump in the road builds your character even further because you understand your limitations and you understand that you can overcome these things. And, you know, back to the story of the prisoners of war, 591 of us came home. And from that 591 men, we produced 17 generals and six admirals. And most of us retired as senior grade military officers. We went back to flying planes and commanding fleets and and battalions all over the world. We have a bunch of congressmen, two United States senators, uh, vice presidential candidate, presidential candidate, uh, all from 591 guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so and and we all felt like we'd failed. We all felt like we'd given up. But even because of that adversity, you know, we we came out stronger than ever before. Yeah, I think this really goes also to the fact that, I, I mean, what you're saying is essentially the fact that you have to know, you have to understand what your weaknesses are. Mm-hmm. You really do. And mm-hmm. and you have to understand human beings and what human beings' weaknesses are. And for me, you know, and I've talked about this a ton on, on this podcast, you have to understand that there's, that human beings are capable of doing very dark and horrible things. Yep. And if you can't, and if you can't, recognize that you yourself are capable of the dark and horrible things and of the weak things, well then you're not really being truthful with yourself and and with your existence really as a human being. And you ignore those things and I think when you ignore those things, I think that's when they sneak up on you. I think you're right. You know, I think that's the crux of our real serious challenge with suicide uh, within the veteran population. And, and I've worked on this, and Jim's worked on this, and, and, and you've worked on it as well. Uh, and one of the advantages we had as prisoners of war is that we, that we exposed ourselves. You know, we recognized our weakness. And, and to a man, we knew that we weren't as strong as we wanted to be. And so um, just, just that community that we built within the prison camp, tapping on walls and tugging on wires and our secret codes, very difficult to communicate with everybody else. But we had leadership there that turned that, 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 turned that whole thing around. And, uh, and the leadership said, wait a minute, you're not a victim. Now I'm a very junior officer there. You know, I'm a Lieutenant JG. And wait a minute, I'm in a communist prison camp. I am bleeding from four open wounds. I have no medical care. I'm I'm I'm, I'm starving. I've been tortured. Uh, I'm down to 115 pounds, and I'm not on the defensive. I'm I'm not a victim. Yeah, yeah, pull up your big boy pants. Let's get on with this thing. We got a war to fight, and 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 so the leadership totally re they, they refocus the whole purpose of, of our being there and that and, and gave us a mission and I think that's one of the challenges we face when a guy gets out of the military or a gal and takes off that uniform he loses the purpose he loses that mission um, and, and, and he uses loses that community and he puts on a, 
a coat and tie or, you know, puts on a, a golf shirt and, and goes out and, 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 and tries to reconnect with people. Um, and it, Jim, is what you were talking about, you know, at, at being in civilian clothes in Paris and you, you were looking for some way to reconnect <laughs> it, it, w- with, with your unit. And ironically, here they come marching down the Champs-Élysées <laughs> to the Lido <laughs> and, 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 and there you were back in uniform. And, and, and so you, and, and you had a, a raison d'etre, you know, you had a purpose, a, a reason to live just because of, of the group that you were associated with. And, and whenever I speak publicly, I, you know, I challenge an audience to, if you've got, if, if, if you know a veteran, you know, uh, talk to them, you know, uh, give them a purpose, uh, you know, invite them to, into your, into your house or your club or your church and uh, it make, make a difference. And that way you can serve your country by serving those who served their country. Yeah, it's a, it's interesting, you know, Jim. You kind of you kind of made that uh, joking comment, you know, hey, Truman dropped the bomb and and ruined a perfectly good war, and we all laughed at it. But we all also kind of understand that there's some level of of reality to that. And you think when you're in the military, and I always, you know, I was I always talk about the fact that when I joined the Navy, it was 1990, and I just missed the first Gulf War, and. Like I was completely dismayed by that because you know there hadn't been a a, a war since basically since Vietnam, so it'd been twenty years, and I'm thinking, okay, there was there was my shot to to fight in a war, and I just missed it, and and so that that what you're talking about of hey, you feel like this is your purpose, and and this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life, and it's a higher purpose, and it's a higher mm-hmm. cause, and it's something that is is bigger than you and so when you're a part of it it feels good and you want to participate and you want to help and then when it's over you look around and you go wait a second what's my higher purpose now Mm -hmm. and and i think you're right that's where people get into trouble because they're so tied to their old higher purpose and they can't transition to the new one and you know i get great feedback from from vets all the time that they do they open up they go okay well what am i going to do now that's that's what i'm looking at what's your next mission going to be yep. what is and you know what your next mission might be being a good dad right yep. that might be your next mission you know yep. what your next mission might be it might be building airplane hangers mm-hmm. you know you, you don't know what your next mission is going to be but find out what your next mission is going to be make it something productive make it something that's going to impact you know at least you and your family and get good at it even if you pick something that's somewhat selfish and you say hey i want to i want to surf on every continent okay that sounds like a good mission to me actually that sounds like a really good mission <laughs> I, I might have to participate in that one but you know you come up with something you okay, okay here's my mission and this sure. is what i'm going to do with it and this yeah. is how i'm going to go forward but yeah i think that the lack of purpose and the lack of mission that guys stumble into is problematic and and it is problematic too because in the military it's I don't want to make this sound the wrong way because I always talk about the fact that for us we didn't get tasked missions like when 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 I was in Iraq we there was no higher up telling me you guys are going to take this target or you guys are going to take that that happened occasionally probably less than 5% of the time most of the time we developed our own missions but overall when you're in the military you have a broad mission that you're trying to accomplish, which again is for societal good. Mm-hmm. And so when that disappears, guess what? You have some autonomy now. Now what are you gonna choose as your next mission? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna improve yourself? How are you gonna improve your life, your families, your communities, or your countries, or the world? What are you gonna do to make it better? And you see the vets that are out there that are doing that, mm-hmm. man, they, 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 they go. They excel. They excel. Absolutely. <laughs> you know when I was in the hospital at Great Lakes um, after the war, I was in a hospital up there. I mean, I, I, I didn't have any serious problems, but I was in a debriefing thing. And, but I had figured out in that hospital, and even on the way home, that my, my next stage of life is going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to try to forget all that six years of, uh, in that prison camp, that six years of pain. Um, and I even had it figured out, I'm going to go to some little town in the middle of nowhere where they've never heard of Charlie Plum. And if they have, I'll change my name because I don't want anybody knowing my history. I want, you know, I want to slide back into the shadows of life. And, and I, I, I was serious about that. You know, my, 
my high, my high school sweetheart had just uh, filed for divorce uh, three months before I came home, and uh, and and so I was, uh, you know, I mean, I felt free and I, I felt energized, but I really didn't want to have anything to do with the Vietnam War or any of the pain that I had faced there. I saw no value in it, and I was, <clears throat> and so. I was the first guy back to the, uh, from the war in the, in the Midwest, and uh, so so the news media, you know, really wanted to talk to me, and so I found myself surrounded by about 150 photographers and reporters in the basement of that hospital, and I told my story, and on the way back up to my hospital room, just as the elevator doors closed, this young reporter um, uh, came up to me, and I'm nose to nose with this young guy, but he's got lines of anguish in his brow and tears in his eyes, and he said, Mr. Plum, you really got to me in there. He said, he said I've had a miserable year. My family's falling apart. My job is terrible. He said, I even wondered if I wanted to go on living. He said, you've given me hope. Well, well I hadn't intended to give anybody any hope. I'm just telling my story here, you know, and, 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 and it surprised me that there was some value in the experience. And so, and, and, and so I said, well, if in fact that, you know, the, the pain of that experience can help one person, you know, in, in life, then maybe there is a purpose to it. And so, uh, so I wrote a book, my autobiography, and I started to promote that book. And, uh, and, and I found that, yes, there, there's, there's a lot of connection with people with challenges. And you don't have to be in the military to have a challenge. And, uh, and, and, and while my experience might have been a little more dramatic, you know, than most, and it's an interesting story. Just to a, tell. Little. Yeah, a little. Bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's still, you know, uh, the, the, the challenges I faced were the challenges that, you know, that, that a single mother trying to make ends meet makes, you know, the frustration and the loneliness and the, and the, and the, the lack of confidence and the feeling that you're not measuring up. And, you know, all of these things, these are, these are common human feelings. You don't have to be in a prison camp to, to be in prison, you know? <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great point. Actually, I was, I was curious because I'd never heard before about the flak houses and that the bombers, the, the bomber crews were being sent to when they'd, when they'd basically said, all right, we're, we're done right now. I mean, what was the casualty rate of the bomber crews? It was something completely insane, wasn't it? Well, it was. They, they had a 25 mission requirement, and the percentages said they couldn't make it. Now, we're talking in night, early 43. The start of the heavy bombing thing was late 42. So, so let me just let me just focus in on that for one second, just to explain to everyone what that means, because I, I did know about the twenty five. So, if you were a bomber crew, you were flying in a in a, what a B seventeen, B seventeen, B twenty four, a B seventeen or B twenty four, big giant flying fortresses, and they would get attacked, ruthlessly attacked, and they'd fly deep into France and on into Germany, and they would get swarmed and attacked by you know, by German fighter pilots and, and also anti-aircraft guns from the ground. That's right. And so it was, it was hellish to get through. And it was so bad that they said, okay, well, all you have to do is this many missions. And the number was 25, which I did know that number. You had to make it through 25 of these bomb runs and you were done. You, you, that was it, you didn't have to do anymore. But you're saying the chances of actually making it through those 25 was minimal. The percentages were against you. Now, sure, some people are going to get through. Some people are going to be shot down on their first mission. They don't get a second mission. But, uh, and this was the problem with the heavy bomber forces. Right. And, and we almost lost that one. I mean, we came close. Well, we were at the ragged edge. And, and, all I, and I'm repeating what I learned as a, as a youngster at that time, trying to be an aviation cadet. It, the guys, we're hanging on by our fingertips. When you say we almost lost that one, you mean we almost had to stop the bombing campaign? We, well, the British were after us. Uh, they had switched to night bombing for this very same reason, to stay away from the fighters. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our philosophy of heavy bombardment goes back to General Mitchell in the in the early and uh, 30s and late 20s, in fact, the early 20s, that the bombers will fight their way through. And that was uh, the theory of the B-17. 
and gosh knows they were heavily armed, but they're off, they were up against a determined uh, enemy. And they're 500 miles from home, and <laughs> German fighters, all they got to do is step out. Mm -hmm. If they don't like what's going on, bail out. They're going to come down and we'll go get another airplane. But uh, uh, those were dark days. And they were dark days until the first uh, uh, fighters, the, the uh, P-47s could only go so deep. Right. What could they go, like 200 miles deep? Uh, 200, 200 miles, yes, and, and have enough fuel to get home on. And the rest of the times, the the other 300-mile round trip or 400 extra miles were all the bombers by themselves. If it was 50 miles, it was hell. Mm. Once the fighters turned back, uh, so they sent four, uh, they ended up with a with four groups of P-38s. The 38 was not ready to go to war over uh, Germany at that time at the altitude. We were having trouble with the airplane and we didn't have the latest uh, modifications to the airplane. So uh, the part of our problem was engine problems with the Allison engines, but they went anyway. And so then the 51 came along. The 51 had a British engine who had been, which had been developed in that very same uh, 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 area, and they, you know, they weren't having the cold. Their their engine had been designed to mm -hmm. operate 60 degrees below zero, and so they they matched the two up, and so in late 43 they get the first group over there, and now there's a little hope. The airplane could go the whole way. The 38s had been going to go the whole way, but 38 had been modified for the Pacific, and there was no heat in the cockpit, and you're sitting up there at 60 degrees below zero, freezing your tail off with the oxygen, the oxygen mass that's actually frozen to your face. Mm. Uh, heat came in. You had one warm spot in the whole com uh, cockpit, and that was your right foot. That's where the heat came in. <laughs> so everything else is freezing your fanny off, and <laughs> so and they had so we had problems. Uh, luckily, the the British engine and the fifty one and North Americans tremendous design put together the airplane that could do the job. Uh, the um, and then they could could the P fifty ones escort them the whole the whole they go mission? the whole way and then wow. cruise around and go someplace else. Wow! Uh, the thirty eight could do that. It had the fuel to do it. But uh, again, you know, there's an old story about the thirty eight that kind of broke our heart. Uh, there was two great modifications to the P thirty eight. The thirty eight at altitude, up with the bombers, and they're hit with fighters. You can get into a scrap, and the German rolls over, and they had, uh, I explained the flick roll that, that I encountered. They'd do a flick roll in split S, make a dive to the deck. If a 38 did that and tried to follow them, the airplane would accelerate into what we call compressibility. And compressibility was nothing more than a shock wave off of the the uh, the wing that killed all the control in your empennade, so you couldn't pull out. So all you could do is ride it down until you got into what we call thick air. Hmm. Got your your uh, uh, then your trim tab, if you set it properly, would gradually bring you out of that dive before you hit the ground. Some of them hit the ground. Mm -hmm. So uh, and. We didn't have, we had a very slow rate of roll in the 38. So they developed uh, aileron boost. Um, so we could actually, we could roll with anybody. Uh, they had the dive flap. So if you went in, you could actually hit the dive flap button, put that airplane straight down and dive with anybody, any German fighter. So what uh, Lockheed did, they got 400 sets, ship sets of dive flaps and aileron boost. And they put it on an, uh, an Air Force uh, transport plane and they sent it to England. It got intercepted off the English coast by the RAF who didn't know anything about it. They thought it was a German Condor four engine everything. They shot it down. Oh boy. 
there, there goes all of our improvements. <laughs> and so what do you do now? It took quite a while to pull all those 400 units together and get them over there. So for the next couple months, uh, the 38s are doing the same old thing. We don't have the improvement. P-51 comes along, thank God, and it can do the job. So it's all history. Yeah. 51's had trouble. We, I know of one that pulled out of a dive and the whole damn engine fell out of the airplane and the guy got killed. Mm. But um, uh, they had engines quit. Every, a single engine fighter, was that's the problem. If somebody throws a rock at you and it hits the radiator, you're all done. Mm. So, um, but those were trying times. Yeah, I guess I was, uh, with all that, you know, thinking about these these guys that were in those bomber crews that would need a break and they say okay you need to go over here and not think about this and it reminds me of you know talking about you know dick winters from the first of the 506 band of brothers and what he would say when he would see guys were getting stressed out you know he'd get them off the line get them out of it and and give them the rest that they need and and then i think i, I think there's a certain part of you that goes okay like i need to not think about this right now and then I think you got to say, okay, now I'm going to talk about this. And, and mm -hmm. the fact that you get around your, your friend, and that's what a lot of people that listen to the podcast, a lot of veterans that listen to the podcast, they go, you know, now, you know, I've, I've had my break, but now you're talking about this stuff and I, I appreciate it. And I bring, it lets me know that I'm not the only guy that thinks this way or had those thoughts or, you know, went through this. And I think that's, that's good. So I think it's, I think you do need a break. And actually that, now that I think about it, when I was in Ramadi, I had, I, the book that I read every night was About Face by Colonel David Hackworth, and I read it every single night, every single night, every single night. And then about three months into deployment, I, I, I wanted to, I, I didn't want to think about, you know, I didn't want to go to bed sleep, sleep, thinking about, you know, the war and war. And, and so I, there was a random book sitting around, and I picked up, it was actually a book called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which is about the hippies in, it's written by Tom Wolfe, who wrote the right mm -hmm, stuff. Sure. But it's a great book, and it was so completely outside of what I was doing that it gave me, you know, like a mental break. And I read that book, and it was, you know, it took me four days to read that book, and I got done, and I put it away. I put, pulled About Face back out, and I continued on, but I just needed a little bit of a breather, mm -hmm. right? Just a little mm -hmm. bit of a mental breather. Mm -hmm. And I guess hippies and LSD provided me with that <laughs> Re reading about those hippies and LSD provided me with this oh, little well. mental break mm -hmm. and, and it was actually it's a very it's a very interesting bo book and it shows the mentality that those people had you know which was the way he summed it up was 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 me 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 everything's about me and, and that was what was good for me to read this book I'm like okay that's not how I want to be with with my life. Mm -hmm. It's not about me. It's about you know what we're trying to do here. So yeah, I think sometimes people need a mental break. I I can't even imagine what the you know what was going on in one of those flack houses with those guys. That Is that like an R and R for you? Uh, no, it was an R and R, and it's uh, they were run by the Red Cross, and I was at Mulford Manor, which was right on the Thames River. Uh, of course, I was there. Uh, when we had the ice storms. In fact, when I left the, the Black House uh, uh, to go back to Paris, I couldn't get a ride across the channel. And guess what? Uh, our friend Glenn Miller got a ride and disappeared. And so I'm trying to get across the channel uh, to Paris, and it's uh, between Christmas and New Year's, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, wait, I went out to uh, uh, several of the bases around run London to get a, an ATC aircraft to go to Paris, and they're all grounded. And so I, I went down to Southampton, and uh, uh, two ships had just come into Southampton that were going on to Le Havre, and so I got on board. And they were hospital ships uh, with uh, complete complement of uh, general hospitals, like two or three different general hospitals, and are full of nurses. Uh-oh. And so New Year's Eve, we're, <laughs> we're on this ship with all these nurses, and 
uh, we're on, uh, I guess you'd call it battle stations, because the e-boats, uh, the German e-boats were operating in the channel, and we're going across from Southampton to uh, uh, La Havre, and all these nervous nurses from the U.S. needed comforting. <laughs> but, um, Did you get a medal for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that was uh, that was the story. Now, just how I got to the end of this story, I've forgotten. <laughs> I don't even care anymore. <laughs> how did I get there? <laughs> but uh, let me, uh, I, I picked up a couple things that, when we were talking, and um, uh, when I got shot down, you read this citation. Well, I didn't know anything about that citation. Uh, I had gotten my fanny shot off. I was not happy. I said, I kept thinking, what could I have done different that I could have stayed in that fight longer? Uh, and I, I never came up with an answer. <laughs> what, what could I have done? So for about from September till I get this orders to go to Paris, to Spots' headquarters, I was not the highest. <laughs> I didn't think much of myself. Was, why did it, uh, didn't it, why couldn't I have done a better job? But, uh, Reading that citation and then belonging to a group called the Legion of Valor, which there are not too many Air Force guys left in it, uh, and I read what these people have done, uh, these ground crews. In fact, one of my very close friends and had the Distinguished Service Cross, and they just upgraded it to Congressional Medal of Honor, and he's gotten quite a bit of publicity and he was in Vietnam. And, and my comment when I uh, uh, saw that he had gotten the Congressional Medal of Honor at this late date, uh, I thought, well, God, somebody finally read his citation. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you think that, that what all of these guys did, a lot of the fellows in the, uh, uh, in the Legion of, of Valor are medics what they did in combat conditions and got to distinguish curves across the navy cross and so forth it's you know I, I read my citation it took six minutes that's all and then i read a book called i'm no hero oh come on <laughs> and i think god charlie plum six years of bat my, six minutes for me. Uh, that's, I mean, what he went through is just unbelievable to me. And so don't give me the bunk about, I'm no hero, he's my hero. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, it's, it's deep thought. Well, thanks for that, Jim. I, I appreciate your saying that. Uh, but let me toss one more question at you, Jocko, because... Jim and I have both talked about getting shot down and feeling miserable. After your, your fight where you accidentally killed one of the Iraqi soldiers, uh, I bet you felt pretty low about that. Yeah, that's about as, that's about as bad as it gets. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was, a, it was a horrible situation. It was the fog of war. Mm -hmm. It was multiple units out on the battlefield. It was, it was actually not, not me that, was, that, that shot an Iraqi soldier. It was one of my sm small teams that was in a position where, you know, amongst the confusion, they were assaulted by a friendly group of Iraqi soldiers with one, they had one Marine with them. And yeah, you, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's something that you can, it's hard to make um, you know, definite statements or, or, or say, I know this for a fact, but there's pretty much not anything worse in war than friendly forces killing friendly forces. Mm. Mm. That just, that's just as bad as it gets. And it's mm. a real taboo in, in special operations for sure. It's a taboo in any, and I'll tell you during the, during the, I guess we'll say the dry years in between Vietnam and, and the current wars we're in, there was 
we actually lost the understanding of how these things could happen. And, and no one really understood the fog of war anymore, and therefore we didn't train to it properly. And so when it happened, it was, it, it was like an unbelievable thing. It was so bad. It was the absolute worst thing that it could happen. Actually, I, I would say there'd be one more thing. You know, the, sol- the, the person that was killed, the soldier that was killed was an Iraqi soldier. You know, if it had been a SEAL or an American, I guess that would make it one level higher for me because I would have known the person. Mm-hmm. You know, in this case, it was an Iraqi soldier. Again, a tragic loss nonetheless. But, you know, h- how did I feel? It felt, it felt absolutely horrible. And the thing that, you know, the thing that changed the mindset for me was when I realized that as I sat there and, and reviewed because you know my commanding officer was coming to inspect and and review what had happened along with the investigating officer and, and you know the thing that changed my mindset was as I sat there and said okay whose fault is this whose fault is this whose fault is this whose fault is this and I'm looking at all the different mistakes that were made by all the different units and all the different people and as I'm looking to blame this on someone, it would became very clear to me in a, like a bolt of lightning that there was only one person in charge of this and therefore there's only one person responsible for what happens out there and that's me. And uh, honestly, the, when I had that transition in thought and it was, it was the first moment that I, f- I felt actually okay, mm-hmm. uh, there's a horrible sinking feeling that you get in 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 wartime situations i guess you can get it in other times too and i've talked about it with with some of my friends it's it's like when something is just really horrible is happening you get this knot in your stomach and this it, it's i've never felt it any other times but when i was overseas of of like this is i i have it's it's the ho- most horrible feeling mm-hmm. and um that was that was the most severe I ever felt it was leading up to my own recognition that you know what and and where that was coming from was the unknown and I didn't know how to react to it and here I was you know mr. experienced seal mr. you know in charge of the task unit whatever and yet here I was going how do I deal with this Mm -hmm. and I didn't understand how to deal with it and what I had to do is go to what I actually did know which is if you're in a leadership position, you take responsibility for what happens. That's what you do. Mm-hmm. So, hey, that's what you do. And if if they're gonna fire you, you get fired. Mm-hmm. If they're gonna reprimand you, you get reprimanded. If they're gonna replace you with someone else, you get replaced, you salute, you do the best turnover you can, you try and do the, you know, give all the information you can, that's what you do. And as soon as I accepted that, and looked at it and said, okay, well then, I, I, that not, started to go away and I realized that okay the, the real problem here is is you, the way that you're looking at this but uh, and then the other big thing is once you admit what those or and you take ownership of those problems and you actually not just take ownership of the problems but you say here's the problems and here's how we're gonna get them solved here's the standard operating procedures that we're now going to follow to make sure that this never happens again well then People look at you and they go, okay, he's got a plan. He's not sitting here dodging the, the blame for this. He's actually taking ownership of the problems and he's going to get them solved. And I think, you know, I've never had this conversation with my commanding officer about his reaction, but I could see it. You know, I could see it. And the fact that I, the fact that he said, okay, you know, let's make sure it doesn't happen again. I like the procedures that you're putting in place. Use caution, proceed. You know, where is I believe that if I would have said, well, it wasn't my fault, it was his fault and their mm-hmm. fault and the other guy's mm-hmm. fault, he would have said, okay, you need, you're not going to have this job anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the same thing with life. You know, yep. the minute that you're, you're looking around you and you're saying, hey, it's someone else's fault that this, mm-hmm. that I'm in this bad situation. And, and again, you know what? Okay. There's things that happen. I, I get that there's things that happen to, to people. You mentioned one of them. You can get a disease that you can't control. You, you know, you can get, uh, you can have uh, you, you know, a child get hit by a car. I mean, there's awful things that can happen that you can't have control over. But what you can have control over is how you proceed and how Absolutely. you go forward. And, and that's the part that you need to focus on because mm-hmm. the, the opportunity to fix what happened in the past, it's gone. I, I'm sorry. There's no time machine. There's no way of going back. 
It's happened, it's gone. Okay, how are you gonna move forward? Where are you gonna go now? That's what you need to focus on. And I've said that about regret too. People say, oh, you know, I, I live with no regrets. I'm like, oh, I, I, there's all kinds of things I'll tell you I regret, but I don't walk around with them because mm-hmm. I can't do anything about them. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, maybe you would have maneuvered your aircraft a little bit different on September 16th, 1944. You've looked at it, maybe you couldn't, but maybe you could have but you don't walk around carrying that because it doesn't mm-hmm. matter anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing with the things I've been through. It's like, okay, look, I made mistakes. You've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. Okay, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna dwell on those and let them you know, bear down on us and even things that we can't control? Maybe the mistake wasn't ours or something that we couldn't control. I'm not gonna carry that. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, not gonna carry that regret. I'm gonna say, what, what can I do to move forward? And actually, there's a great guy I just had on the podcast named Rob Jones. He's a Marine. He fought in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and he ended up, he was a he was a bomb disposal, digging for mines, a combat engineer, and he ended up finding a mine, and he, he found that mine, you know, with his own feet, and he, he lost both of his legs, and he said something that was, was awesome. He said, you know, you've got this weight that's bearing down on you, and he was sitting in a hospital bed, and he had this weight that was bearing down on him of he's gonna live now the rest of his life with you know both legs amputee, amputated above the knee. And he, you know, he said, what am I gonna do with this weight? Am I gonna let it, am I gonna let it push me down and, and bury me under the ground? Or am I gonna use that weight to make myself stronger? And I think that's a, incredible attitude mm-hmm. to have mm-hmm. and and by the way he's about to run 31 marathons oh. in 31 oh. days oh. he's gonna run 31 marathons in 31 days oh, yeah <laughs> yeah unbelievable sure so is. you know the toughest uh, flying that I ever did uh, was in combat in support of the ground troops and they'd uh, bring us in uh, with uh, rockets or bombs or napalm. We didn't have any guns on that airplane. <clears throat> and, uh, but we knew that we had to get close, but not too close to the, to the friendlies uh, to be effective. You know, we, could, we couldn't uh, put our weapons, uh, you know, 40 clicks away and, and, and do any good at all. Uh, but if we get in too close to start singeing the mustaches of those uh, soldiers and Marines down there. And, and, and I would, uh, by the way, if you get too close, actually, it goes way beyond singeing mustaches. You, yep. If you go too close, you can kill friendly oh, troops. Yeah. And again, we're oh, back to what absolutely. we just talked about. So that's that's and, a nightmare. And it was done. You know, I mean, it, it, again, the fog of war. And that's what happens. And it's really, really unfortunate. So, so I would get that not in my stomach whenever I was called in to support the ground troops. And a fact would, you know, torch off the, the smoke signal. And I'd look at the wind and try to figure out exactly how I can get in there close and lots of times I would go below the frag pattern of the bomb I was dropping just so I could get more accuracy <clears throat> and and we all did that you know we, we weren't supposed to but uh, you know an, an average bomb uh, you know 500 pound bomb would have a frag pattern of 2400 feet above the ground that's what you were flying through after you dropped the bomb and we'd go below that just to get more accuracy um, so, because we knew that those guys were dependent on us and boy, they were, there were some happy facts, you know, after we, after we would uh, support those ground troops. But it was, um, you know, it was pretty scary stuff. Um, but back to your point about blaming other people. I had a coach early on uh, a very losing team, sorry to say. But, uh, but, he, but he, would, he, he, he told us this, because we'd start, you know, blaming other things for the problem. You know, yeah, we were away and we didn't, you know, the, 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 the things weren't right. And somebody, we blamed somebody for this or somebody that, or the, you know, the refs were calling it uh, bad calls and all this stuff. And he said, you know, he said, um, uh, the difference in success and failure in life is not the things around you. It's the choices you make about things around you and you can blame everybody else for your problems but in doing so you give away control of your life and I think that's the the accountability issue that you're talking about you know is that there's there's certainly freedom in discipline there's also freedom in accountability I think because when you like you say you know when you say okay yeah lots of people made a lot of mistakes but oh by the way I was in charge And, and so you know the onus is really on me and, and I find that when I, when I practice taking, um, when I, I, I practiced, uh, taking responsibility for some of the bad things that really weren't my fault, 
uh, and, and I practice doing that, it, it frees me up, I think, to, li- you know, to live a, um, a freer life. Yeah, and that's actually an interesting point because sometimes people, they, they, they hear, like they'll read the book Extreme Ownership that we wrote. Mm-hmm. And they go, okay, cool. Well, all I need to do is take ownership of the problems and then I'm, then I'm a good guy, yep. right? They go, oh, you know, hey, these mistakes happen. It's my fault, you know, so let's get them fixed. And, and it actually doesn't work. I actually, and, and, and when I say, hey, there was all these mistakes that were made on the battlefield and different people made actual mistakes. They made mistakes. The, the, the day we had that blue on blue. There was other people that made mistakes. What I'm saying isn't like, oh, those were my mistakes. Hey, it's my fault. No, no, no. What I'm saying is actually, truthfully, those mistakes were things that I should have foreseen, that I should have understood better, that I should have planned better, that I should have trained guys better for. That they, they, are, they, they made the mistake, but the root problem of that mistake is my fault. It's not just saying, hey, my boss, it's, it's it, you know, oh yeah, that was my fault. No, 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 it actually is my fault. And I, I have this conversation too, where people say, well, what if I do, if, what do I do if I tell my employees, oh guys, it was my fault. And then my employees say, yeah, that's right, it was your fault. And the people don't know what to do. And I said, well, it is your fault. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying this so that it makes people not look at you and blame. No, no, no. And someone says, if I say, Charlie, we screwed up this mission. It was my fault. And you go, that's right. It was your fault. I don't go, no, no, no. It was, no, no, it was your fault. No, no, no. That's not how it works. I say, Charlie, I was the commander of this mission. I didn't give you enough information. I didn't, I didn't re- review your plan well enough. I didn't give you the training that you needed. I didn't give you the support that you needed. That was my fault. That is what, and here is what I'm going to do to fix it. So when I look at you and say, hey, this is my fault that this happened and you say you're right it was I go exactly these are the things I'm gonna do to fix it here's what the way we're gonna do this from now on here's some procedures we're gonna put in place so that this doesn't happen so yes extreme ownership is not by any stretch an escape hatch it's right. not right. in fact when you take ownership you shut the hatch and you <laughs> walk right. you're there and you're not getting out <laughs> the only way to get out is to find solutions for the problems and move forward yep. so it's an interesting uh, it's interesting well, that brings me up to civilian life. Now, you've talked about a mission and uh, having something out in front of you. Well, I, I got off active duty in 1948, June, exactly two years before Korea started. Mm. And um, my father-in-law, who actually became almost like a father to me, we by that time we'd been married for three years, and... Uh, uh, he was deeply involved in the paper industry. He was president of uh, wax pa- uh, Western Wax Paper here in Los Angeles, and he had sold the company to Crown Zellerback. And his best friend was uh, Richard McDonald, who was executive vice president of Crown Zellerback. And uh, between the two of them, uh, they de- found this little paper company, and... Uh, they're going to take care of their son-in-laws and son. And so uh, uh, Dick McDonald got off active duty as an engineer in the Army uh, before, uh, before I did. So he arrived at the paper company maybe a, almost a year before I did. And uh, I had put my, all the money I had into this company before. Well, I was still on active duty. So um, I come home in June 48, and it's 4th of July coming up, and and my father-in-law takes me down, and we buy three civilian suits, and all of a sudden I'm a civilian, and I'm going to go work for this little company, and Dick McDonald was running the company because he was there a year before, but we had a partner in this company, and so I go down and I go to work. And boy, I'm, uh, because I'm mechanically minded, minded, they put me in charge of the operation, the plant operation. So now I'm a civilian and I'm working hard. And it goes for about three months. And then I begin to notice that we get an order in. And we, by that time, we had maybe 50 employees. And we were making paper napkins and shelf paper and all these little items. We were what was called a paper converter. And so uh, 
I noticed in running the plant that we'd get an order in and I'd look at the inventory and we'd had so much paper back in the inventory and I'd go back and check it and we ain't got it. <laughs> and so now what's wrong? And so we had a little meeting and we decided, well, maybe we better take an inventory and see what's in the back of the plant there. And it turns out that our partner, who actually had control of the company, uh, was deathly afraid to admit that he had been losing money. And he wasn't dishonest or anything, he just didn't want to admit it. And so to cover the losses, he inflated the inventory. Huh. So now we have this big meeting, I'm 90 days into being a civilian, and we take the inventory and we add all this up, and Dick McDonald and I owe Crown Zellerback Corporation about $20,000. <laughs> it's 1948, <laughs> and let me tell you, $20,000 is one hell of a lot, a lot of money. Wow. And I mean, this uh, is when a house would cost, what, $500 to $1,000? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, so, uh, now what do we do? Um, well, the first thing we do is... Uh, welcome, our, welcome to the business world. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the business world. <laughs> we, we decide that we better do something. And our father, and my father-in-law and Richard McDonald's father said, well, what are you going to do? Well, the first thing we had to do is we had to go up and talk to Crown Zeller back in San Francisco. And so in order to do that, I had to buy a top coat and a hat because if you didn't go to San Francisco on a business uh, meeting without having a hat and a top coat. And so we get on, the, get on the train and we go to San Francisco and we're plotting the whole way up there. What are we going to tell them? I had no idea, and got off the, the train at the station up there, got a taxi, and we'd go down to Sanson Street to this big, beautiful building, this Crown Zellerback, and, and I'm wearing my hat and my new top coat, and I'm going to see Mr. Zellerback himself. And just as I walk in the front door, some goddamn pigeon up above, let's go. <laughs> Right down across my brand, brand new top coat. Now, the world, the world can't be any worse than this. <laughs> now what do I do? <laughs> well, we had our meeting with uh, Mr. Zellerback, and he was very, very gracious. Uh, he's, all he said was, when are you going to pay us the $20,000? <laughs> so he said, well, we're going to work on it. And we did, and we worked very hard for about two years. And we finally began to make some money, getting ahead, and um, Korea started, the 25th of June. And uh, about a week later, this fellow walks into our office and he said, we have a problem, the, I'm from the US government. And he said, you know, we have, we have to build up our supplies, and one thing that we just can't seem to solve is toilet tissue for K rations. A uh, little pack of toilet tissue with a little piece of paper around it, too. And so he said, we got one machine that belongs to one of the paper companies, and he said, we've got that machine working uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we're not getting enough uh, uh, toilet tissue into these K rations. What can you do? I don't know how in the heck he found us, but anyway, he didn't. So we thought, well, we took a look at it, and we figured that we could go to Crown Zeller back and get interfold tissue paper, and you could sit down and you could flick 20 sheets of, of interfold make two folds in it, and then we had to have a tube. And so our superintendent and I went out and we bought a nickel, a little machine that made a nickel uh, pack for a, a dollar's worth of nickels, a tube, mm -hmm. 20 nickel. We made the tube, 
and we cut it in half. Now we got a tube to put the 20 sheets in. And so I sit down for about an hour and I folded paper and they timed me and they figured it as rough as I am, why, if, if I can do it that much in, in an hour, then a young lady could do it. So we hired about 50 gals and we put, put them to work and making these little toilet tissue wraps and putting a tube on it and throw it in a box and we put them on piecework. And um, they were doing very well. In fact, we were out producing Scott Tissue's machine Whoa. almost immediately. And these little gals down in East Los Angeles were making more money than anybody else <laughs> in East Los Angeles on piecework. And so everything's going great. We're making money. We're paying off the balance of the $20,000 we owe two years later. And um, a guy walks into the office. He came into my office. And he says, you know, he said, we got a situation here. And he had some of my these packs. And he said, um, he said, I'd like to see your operation. So we took him out in the plant, and he picked up some of these tubes, and he looked at them, took them apart, counted the tissues in front of me, and they were all perfect. And he said, um, uh, I got something to show you. Uh, and he pulls these little notes out, and he said, just read them. And here's his little note written in handwriting in this tube. And these young ladies had been writing these little notes and putting them inside the, the, two, the tissue, and they left nothing to your imagination. <laughs> 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 and he said, <laughs> he, he said, can you imagine some GI in a foxhole in the rain taking this apart and reading this note? How's he going to feel? <laughs> oh, I said, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> I mean, what are we? He says, why don't we just leave it alone? <laughs> Let's not talk to the gals. Just let them keep on doing it. It has to be a royal bill. Yeah. Anyway, that's how we paid off the $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> so believe me, that two years of trying to pay that off, the military training that I had really <laughs> was very helpful. <laughs> There must be a museum somewhere that's looking for those tubes. <laughs> you know, I have one. I'm down. Oh, really? It's not a. It's not an original. Uh, somebody picked it up after. It must have been for uh, Vietnam. They they were they picked it up and were producing them. So I just I have one on my desk. <laughs> just as a reminder. But that's awesome. Story. But it's um, you know having a mission. Uh, I I got a mission real quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, it was a very discouraging one to think of owing twenty thousand yeah. dollars when that was <laughs> well over twice what I paid for my house. <laughs> wow. wow. Uh, I just looked at my watch. We've been going for about two hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> I say we wrap up this run. Um, Echo, you got anything else? Have you said anything today? No. Okay. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I do. Um, when I lived in Honolulu, I had a motor scooter as well. Really? Crashed it. Didn't break my leg. Okay. <laughs> so I was That's relating to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, they can get you. You yeah. Oh, yeah. You feel so like free with it and you want to do yeah. stunts and yeah. Yeah. Yes. Be it careful get on dangerous. the scooters. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. Especially in Honolulu. Oh yeah. You can go yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. But yeah. Other than that, that's it. Thank you both very, very much. Oh hey. Proud to be with you. Right on. Charlie Plum, sir. Anything else you wanna? You want to say? I think we've covered it all. Really great being with you guys. You know, I think that the, the, the transfer of our, not necessarily our knowledge, but our, and our war stories, but just uh, the philosophy, you know, that we're coming up with. Because it, uh, it, it, it spans the test of time, I think, and will continue to spend span the test of time you know the accountability issue uh 
the face your fears issue, the making choices issue, the re, you know refusal to, to blame other people for your problems. You know, take take control of your life, and it's just not just a military thing. I think it's true with uh, with our kids, and it's uh, true with students and politicians and all all manners of our society. Just I think needs a. A, a little shot, you know, of, uh, uh, of accountability. Agree. Well, I'd agree with Sir. that. And I think that, you know, meeting Charlie and what a wonderful spokesperson he is, uh, he's actually uh, gotten me into a uh, position that I had to talk in front of the crowd a few <laughs> times. And, and I always try to get in first because I... <laughs> I don't want to follow yeah. him, that's for sure. <laughs> People will be walking out. <laughs> so while, while they're captive, I want to talk to them. Yeah. But I would love to be able to reach some of the, as you are doing, reach some of these young people who, who not that they're, just because they're not thinking the way I think, but I think they're losing something. They're, they're losing something that this great country has given to an awful lot of people. And uh, I, uh, I, I feel that I'd like to reach them, and I can't, and I think you're reaching them. I think Charlie's reaching them. You're reaching you them, actor, You're reaching them. But uh, there's so much we could say. And uh, my granddaughter just uh, graduated from the University of Michigan four years, and it's pretty liberal school, and we, we pay a lot of money and our, send our kids to school, and sometimes they, they get some wrong thoughts, and at least I think they're wrong. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're right, but I don't think so. And so uh, I think the work you're doing and Charlie's doing and the three of you are doing uh, is so, so important. And for the future. Well, obviously, thank you for coming for coming on the show, both of you. It's it's such an honor to be sitting here with you guys, and and also we wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't you know for for men like you that stood up and and fought, and that's why we're here, and that's why we have the freedom to be here to do this and the freedom to try and pass that information on so people understand what kind of sacrifices were made so that we can live in this amazing country with this incredible amount of opportunity to do just about anything you want. And whether that's take care of your family or go out and build some kind of a corporate empire, you can do it here and you can be happy in any one of those categories. And it's amazing. So thank you for coming on. And again, I think if it wasn't for generations of men like you answering the call to fight, then our great nation would have perished long ago and it would have perished to tyranny and it would have perished to darkness. But because of you and men like you we do live in freedom and we provide hope and light to the world so thank you both for giving that to us so we wrapped up with charlie plum and with jim kunkel in in the hangers I got a little uh, off track at the end there. I know that we were going to mention at least some social media and Charlie Plum's information. I failed to do that. We're now back in the studio to do that right now. So if anybody wants to link up with Captain Charlie Plum, you can find him on Twitter. He is at Captain Capt Plum, Plum. So C A P T P L U M B. That's on Twitter. He's also Charlie Plum on Facebook, or you can go to charlieplum.com. 
if you want to get in touch with him. Also, if you do want to find either myself or Echo Charles, you can find us also on Twitter, on Instagram, and also on the Facebooky. You can find us there. Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And if you want to support this podcast in any way, Echo, how can we do that? Anyways, I'll keep this brief. Try to. Origin. OriginMain.com. Maine, the state. So OriginMain.com. Good stuff gear. All made in America from the cotton, the actual raw cotton to the material to make it. All the way into what? Shirts, pants, geese. Is geese their flagship kind of flagship? Thing, you think? Yes. Yeah. Geese. That's the origin of origin is to make jujitsu geese in America. Yeah. But now we're making all kinds of all stuff. All kinds of cool stuff. Anyway, yeah. Go to the website, check those ones out. Compression gear also. Yeah. <laughs> Not just rash guards. Yeah, compression. Compression gear. gear. Are we calling the rash guards p- compression gear? I don't know. You we're gonna have to figure that one out. Yeah. Compression gear sort of sounds all technical. Yeah. Rash guards sort of the reality, the scenario in the surfing situation. Yeah. Yeah. So both, whatever you like. You know what we mean. Yeah. <laughs> you know what we're coming from on yeah. that one. Ultimately, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, super krill. That's Jocko Super Krill. Mm. Krill oil. Mm-hmm. That's out. Yep. Origin Maine. And then you click on labs, right? There's yep. like a labs yep. tab. Boom. And they got a little bar. You, you'll you see it. Yeah. Go there. Go to originmain.com. And, and then a bunch of people pre-ordered it. Ordered it. So yes. what? They should start oh, seeing it's, it in the mail. No, they're then. getting it. People have it now. Oh, dang. Okay. And, yeah, yeah, there you go. And yeah, if you want more, you can get it there. Yeah. And joint warfare. That's a good one, too. Yeah. So if you got this blend, you got the, the, buy, the double, you know, situation that's ultimately the kit right the joint maintenance excellence kit that's it yeah <laughs> boom and then yeah like i said geese rash guards all kinds of cool stuff just go in there and that's a that's a good way to support also fitness gear kettlebells you know how like you mentioned this and i and i posted a little instagram video of me I, I, you know how you said a random yeah right yeah, yeah. i'm walking through the I house i saw that instagram that, yeah. that was a I'll, I'll give you credit yeah, that yeah. was a very good Instagram video. <laughs> I liked it a lot. That actually, that is exactly it, what that was. It was when you said, "Yeah, I keep my uh, yeah." Sometimes on it. just do a snatch. Yeah, I just do feel a like clean and jerk. A clean and jerk. Yeah. So that's what yeah. it was. You know, you walk by it, you notice it, boom, hit boom. it. Yeah, that thing was calling you out. You know, who's who, who called out who now? But I will admit, now that I have like the whole set, pretty much, chimp, werewolf, gorilla, seventy-two pounds. Bigfoot, ninety pounds. They're all out there, right? You know, right where you, where I made that video. I feel the same way as you. When I walk by, you just you kind of yeah. want to, and that's good for you. Yeah, unless you're all super cold and stiff, and then you want to grab the the ninety pound one. Mm-hmm. That's not good for Go you. Go a little lighter. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you're stiff, and yes. cold. Anyway, point there being, I, I digress. Anyway, I get my kettlebells from on it. So kettlebells are cool, of course. I'm not going to go into a whole kettlebell thing. No, I'm not going to. But if you want the cooler kettlebells, the kettlebells, the artistic ones, I like the Onnit ones. Proved. Werewolf one, I think, is my favorite one. It's dope. You can get the regular ones, too. Anyway, also a bunch of other stuff, maces, battle ropes, like any kind of kind of the functional train. Would yeah, you call it's it functional, functional stuff? Functional. Yeah. It's functional. And it's, I guess the word is fitness, even though I don't like that word. That's that's why I was kind of asking. Yeah. So you just like, say functional training, I guess. Hardcore functional training. Yeah, there is some cool stuff on there. And all the info behind it, too. Anyway, onit.com slash Jocko. That's a good way to support. Also, when you buy books, including but not limited to Charlie Plum's book, Jocko's book, go to the website. Charlie Plum's book is called I'm No Hero. Yeah, that's what it's called. Or I'm not a hero. I'm no hero. Anyway, go to jockopodcast.com. Yeah, for that book, actually get it from charlieplum.com. Okay. That's the best place to get that book. Okay. Actually, you know what? I'm going to link it to Charlie Plum. Yeah, cool. One, on Do the it. website. Do but it. Yeah. That's a good idea. So, nonetheless, go to jockopodcast.com. Go to the book section. Boom. Click through there when you get your books. 
it's a good way to support. Brings you to Amazon and, and boom, could you do, do other shopping? shopping? You sure could. Like it. Le, as in duct tape, ear earphones. Sarah Armstrong bought something big. I forget what. A lawnmower. Lawnmowers. I don't know. If you need a lawnmower, definitely. Yeah, Amazon yeah, yeah. click through. For good sure. Good way to support you. Very good way. Also, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and all other podcast providing platforms. Seems obvious, but hey, that's a good way. Also, on YouTube, put some excerpts on there. Put one out the other day. Mm-hmm. Good one. Um, very shareable, but n- nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, subscribe to the YouTube. Uh, that's a good way to support. You get other stuff on top of the video version of this podcast, excerpts, and how should I say? Other creative short films yeah. by one Echo Charles. Sure. With cool. people that we know acting in them. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes. But yeah, some value there. Anyway. Yeah, YouTube, subscribe to YouTube. That's a good way. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store, jockostore.com. There are some good shirts on there. Literally. Literally. I'm sure this is good backwards. Anyway, um, I'm not saying to buy something. Just go on there, check out stuff. If you like the stuff on there, get something. This is stuff for women, shirts, patches, rash guards, hoodies. Any day now, the hoodies are the more, they're heavier. You know? Oh, yes. And I'm going to put some new rash guards. The heaviest. They're th- well, here's the thing about the heaviest. So I'm going through the options, you know. How, there's one that's like too heavy and it's like super expensive. You've never been to Michigan. They're like <laughs> <laughs> You've never been to Maine. Yeah, well. I te- I oh, I guess you have been to Maine. You've never it been to Maine. It wasn't that cold. Time. It wasn't that cold. Yeah, no, I get it. Um, put it this way. I'm convinced for whatever that's worth, I'm convinced this is the appropriate one. Okay. That's what I think. Well, we, meaning everyone that listens to this yeah. and myself, we will be the judge of that. Uh, yeah. Especially people that are from the north of America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Canada. Sure. The northern region. I, yeah. hey, I got you. And I'm, I'm confident. England. Sure. Yeah, just give me the feedback. All cool. good. We will. Um, also, psychological warfare. On your journey slash campaign against weakness if you run into those days where you're not feeling like it and that's affecting you where you're led to make or potentially make the decision to slack hit the snooze skip the workout cheat on the diet procrastinate more or other forms of weakness you listen to this album with tracks, Jocko tracks, telling you pragmatically why you shouldn't give in to those weaknesses. Results do not vary. 100% success rate on that one, in my experience. Psychological Warfare on iTunes, Amazon Music, anywhere where they sell MP3s. It's a good one. Very effective. Good way to support as well. Also, on Amazon, Jocko White Tea. You can get that through Amazon. You just search Jocko White Tea, and then you order it, and then you drink it, and then you start throwing things around and smashing everything around you. That's what it does. No big deal. Be prepared. Do have some books there, too. You can get them. Way of the Warrior Kid. That's a kid's book. Extreme Ownership. That's a book about leadership. Discipline Equals Freedom. Field Manual. That comes out October 17th. It's it's a book about getting after it, for lack of a better word. Now, what's interesting about this is the book is the book is not going to be available through Audible itself. It's going to be available through MP3 platforms such as iTunes, Google Play. What other platforms are there? Amazon. Amazon Prime music, music or, listening. Yeah, am- Amazon. So yeah. that's what's going to be available. The reason we did that is that the beats so that we could instead of just make it a big long, f- multi-hour drone of talking, it's cut up as an album with tracks, with tracks sure. which seems to be the way. That way you can utilize it for just quick listening, for almost like you'd use psychological warfare album. 
yeah, and it's it's a manual. That's why, right? Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like this. Um, no, it's cohe- not a story. Like a it's not a story. story. Yeah, no, it's exactly. not a story. Yeah, Discipline yeah. goes warfare. Di- I mean, Discipline goes freedom. Field manual is not a story. Yeah. It's a field manual. Sure, <laughs> it's instructions. So you can get that there for your business. Echelon Front Leadership. Me, Leif Babin, JP Dinell, Dave Burke, if you want to get tied into that, if you want us to come out and work with your company, info at echelonfront.com. So that is that. Those are all great ways to support this podcast. We appreciate it. And thanks to everyone for your support and mostly for listening to the podcast, especially those that are out there in uniform that provide the freedom and protection that we will never take for granted. Freedom that men like Charlie Plum and Jim Kunkel fought and sacrificed to uphold for us. And I would simply ask everyone to make something out of the freedom that you have. Don't waste it. And the way that you get the most out of your freedom, I'll tell you about what way that is. The way you get the most out of your freedom is discipline. That's how you get the most out of your freedom. Push yourself hard, get things done, create and build and make yourself the best you that you can in everything that you do. But getting out there and getting after it. So until next time, this was Mr. Jim Kunkel, Captain Charlie Plum, and Echo and Jocko. Out.